Okay, it's 6.30, so we're going to get started. Um, this is Zach Cintron, uh, one of the SOMD sports directors, specifically for swimming. Um, along with me tonight, I do have Steve Bennett um, and Mark, Mike Sarnowski. We'll chime in, chime in if he uh, has anything he wants to add. Um, I will just let you all know at the moment you are currently all muted. Um, and if you do have a question, we do ask you to type it into the group chat um, for the primary portions of the presentation. Um, there are portions of the slides tonight where we will open it up for questions. Um, so before we get going here, the first thing I want to show you guys, um, if any of you are new to Zoom, is how to um, get to the chat to type in a question and additionally how you can raise your hand if you do have a question when we get to the sections to open up the phone line. So for Zoom, everybody should have a a little toolbar that pops up and see that at the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen depends on your preference. Um, and then, so if you want to get to the chat, which is the first thing you should find, there is three dots and it says more and you can select chat. Chat will then pop up in your, uh, the side of your, your screen. Um, and from there, you can type in a message, hit enter, um, it'll go to everyone um, and then we will be able to see it. Um, additionally, if you are looking to raise your hand, um, there should be a section that you can go to for a participant, and there'll get, be a little toolbar at the bottom underneath everybody's name that has uh, a yes, no, go slower, go faster, more, but there is a raise hand button, and if you click it, um, you should see in participants where uh, my SOMD sports name is, that a little blue hand pops up. Um, that's how we'll know to unmute your line. And then from there, uh, we will let you ask your question. Uh, and then once your question is answered, we will more than likely mute you again. Um, one of the biggest things we always want to cut down on is background noise uh, to make things easier. So if you do have a question during one of those periods, again, that's where you can find the raised hand button. Um, hey, Zach. Uh, like, yes, sir. Um, just, just to let you know, there are two people in the waiting room. Um, Katie Sheeman and then another one, and I didn't know if I could admit them into the meeting or that's something you have to do. Nope. If if you see them, you can let them in. That'd be awesome, Steve. Thank you. Okay. There uh, should be in now. Thank you. Go ahead. Yep. They're in. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, again, just a reminder, we are recording this um, like we do for a lot of our trainings and our pre-competition webinars and all that kind of stuff. Um, we just like to let you know, again, the, the little voice on the recording when you get in lets you know as well. Um, additionally, just to remind you all, this is for SONA sports certification for swimming. Um, the game plan for tonight, there is four parts of this presentation. And we do plan to take a break, about a five minute break at part two and part three. Part four is pretty short, so we'll kind of just keep going through to the end at that point. Um, if, again, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, um, if for some reason uh, you can't hear me or one of us or you need uh, audio uh, assistance or something, please let me know. Um, we can take a pause, see if we can help you really quick. Otherwise, we will keep rolling through the presentation for tonight. So to begin, um, again, the, the content for this training um, is focused around facilitating and managing a, a swimming competition. Um, I will say after the first two sections, uh, well, it becomes a little more generalized. Um, the prep for swimming is a little bit different. Um, you'll find it's similar to sports like track and field, long distance running, um, cycling, kayaking, all your traditional time slash distance kind of sports, right? So we'll talk a lot about swimming specific stuff in the first two sections, and it'll kind of generalize, generalize from there. Um, but we wanted to give you guys this opportunity to attend a, a swimming-oriented coaches training to give you some other tools in your tool belt. Some of you have probably run competitions before. Um, I've been to a lot of your competitions before. Um, but maybe this will jog some new ideas for you um, and just give you some, some chances to ask questions potentially around things that you may do at your competitions that you you have thought about changing or you've looked at and said, I don't, I don't really know which direction to go with this. So that's kind of the game plan for the night uh, is to offer this opportunity for you guys to, to reflect on the competitions that you may have, learn a little about competition stuff that you may not be doing up to this point, 
um, and ask those questions that you may have had already. So the first question, right, why do you need to host a, a qualifying competition? One of the biggest things is that it's an easy way to ensure that your athletes and partners are, are guaranteed um, registration at least one qualifying competition, right? One of the toughest things talking to coaches across, you know, the years, you know, multiple state programs all over the place. Everybody has issues with making sure they get their athletes to enough competitions. Um, whether it is one availability of competitions, two availability of that athlete and family planning that they may have, or anything else that may come up. If you are holding a qualifying competition of your own, that you have a date early enough out, that should ensure that all of your athletes and unified partners can at least get to that competition, and then you can kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together from there. So then the next one talks about, you know, holding a multi-area county local program competition. Um, again, that, that guarantees that you, your athletes, your unified partners, your program gets an experience at a competition with multiple programs involved, which again, if, if you go back to a uh, pre-competition webinar, that is one of the things that your team does have to attend is a, a multi-area county local program. That's what we'd like you to get to, right? Um, so if you're holding one of your own, you can check that right off the list, right out the gate. Um, and again, something as an athlete myself growing up, um, especially for football, right? Growing up playing football, one of the things that I always looked forward to was that first scrimmage against another team. You're all summer, you're running around, you're, you're hitting your, your teammates and stuff like that, but you finally get to practice and play and compete in the sport against somebody else that you don't see every day. It's a, it's a great opportunity and it's just a different experience. You know, it, it just gets those competitive um, mindsets going for all of your athletes. Um, like we talked about, I mentioned really quickly, um, and if you are, were on the, the pre-season webinar, um, in order to be eligible for summer games, uh, your team, athletes, and unified partners um, must go to two qualifying competitions prior to summer games each year. Um, again, typically people would love to get teams as a whole to qualifying events um, more than individuals or small groups. We understand that doesn't always happen. So if you're hosting one big competition in your own neck of the woods, again, you can check that off right out the gate. Um, and then that secondary note again of one of those two qualifying competitions must be that area, county, local program of multiple programs. Again, to get that experience of working with multiple teams, going into one pool, working through staging, all those different little pieces that your athletes then progress to experience at summer games or a regional style um, event that you may not be hosting. So what's the basics of, of hosting a competition, right? What are those basic things that you need to think about and look into when considering holding a competition? Um, again, step one, it's got to be approved by your area, county, local program director. Um, you know, it, it's great to, to host the competition in a program, but there's other pieces that you're talking about that they need to think about and approve as well, you know, finances, um, availability, all those kind of things, right? Um, one of the biggest things and the toughest things for swimming is the facility being identified and confirmed, right? For swimming and basketball, those are two of the toughest facilities to try to get, um, especially when our season is hosted because you're coming out of uh, collegiate and some high school seasons are still going on through the spring, same time we are. So it can be difficult to get a facility. Um, again, a good tip is always try to get that facility lined up six months prior. Um, the dream obviously is having that facility lined up um, a year prior. So when your event finishes the year before, you're ready to roll. You, you talk to the facility, they get you on the calendar. With that said, a lot of pools are attached to schools, so they don't know their own schedule until the new school year starts. Um, sometimes if you're lucky and you have a conference uh, and a high school with a really proactive AD, they may have it, you know, a month or two before school starts. Um, but sometimes you are at the mercy of the facilities uh, scheduling and programming prior to you getting your date. Um, so we understand that for sure, because we, of course, go through the same thing. Um, Again, having a games management team in place to facilitate each piece of the competition 
Having a games management team uh, takes the burden off of you directly. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about games management teams specifically, but having a team prepared that comes in year in, year out, knows the game plan, knows the facility, and can operate the event. So especially if you're a coach overseeing a team, you could be that coach still. Um, volunteer assistance recruited as needed. Every one of our events needs volunteers. We are unbelievably volunteer driven without our volunteers, without you guys. None of this happens. Um, we have those conversations with you guys all the time. And it's one of those things where that can be one of the toughest parts of preparing to host a competition. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit in depth as well about how to recruit volunteers and what you may need. Um, programs register their athletes via a system, Excel, GMS, whatever it may be. Um, registration, you guys, of course, go through that a lot of the times for our state level programs and you go through GMS with that. Um, and then you guys have probably also participated with programs or have done it yourself where it goes through an Excel spreadsheet. Both are viable options, uh, but you know that program registration can be difficult at times. There's a lot of pieces that go into that, uh, but we'll talk through that and some of the pieces and how to navigate that as well. Um, and then again, the competition held following uh, Special Olympics and USA swim rules as standards. Uh, again, it's preparing swimmers for what they'll experience as they move to higher levels of competition. Of course, it prepares them year in and year out to attend summer games if they're going. But then if they're an athlete that eventually progresses onto a, a national invitational tournament, onto national games, onto world games, if you are holding competitions at the standard of SO and USA swim rules, um, they're prepared for all levels of competition and they shouldn't be surprised for anything down the road. Some other points to hit here, um, again, you in the most ideal state, and we really, really want to push for this more consistently, um, is competitions overseen by certified officials. Um, USA Swim, in this case, um, I also put USA Cycling. Um, whatever the national gov governing body is, again, you want your athletes getting that experience of true officials so when they move on to higher levels of competition, they're not surprised by anything. Um, and again, that also helps you guys and your athletes prepare for higher levels of competition where if they get disqualified for something at your level of meet and they do progress onto summer games, national games, world games, whatever it may be, then at that point, you guys know what potentially needs to be worked on as they move forward. Um, again, officials operate the same standard as, as if you were going to any state games, um, as if you were going to any national games. Again, we want to keep that consistency for our athletes to be prepared for higher levels of competition. Um, meals and refreshments may be provided for registered delegates. Again, if decided upon by the management team that you guys are offering lunch. Um, you know, again, quick example, we'll, we'll reference Loyola quite a bit um, through this because, again, we, the ideal uh, setup for this training was that the second part was going to be part of Loyola. But, of course, with the current uh, COVID situation, we have made it all online. Uh, but we don't offer lunch at, at Loyola because we're out of there by 1230. Um, if you have a full day event, that's something that you may look into. Um, awards may be presented. Again, if determined by the host of the event is a competition and not just a qualifier or time tri trial to gather times. Um, again, Loyola is, is more of a time trial and qualifier. We're looking to get athletes to get in the pool at the beginning of the season, get that competition experience, get some base level times to start progressing and working on throughout the season. Um, so we, we don't offer awards at um, Loyola because it is more of a time trial qualifier. Um, and then one of the biggest ones, of course, is medical on site. Um, that also includes having lifeguards for swimming, of course. Um, and when you're talking about having lifeguards, of course, you want them certified. Um, we'll, we'll talk about lifeguards a little bit more down the road, but um, a lot of times, you will have to use whatever facility you're at, their lifeguards now. Um, that's kind of become a little bit of a standard. Um, so when it comes to lifeguards, there's a chance you, you'll have to factor them into your budget. Um, they, they will probably charge you to uh, have their lifeguards on site. But again, that's what we want for our athletes. Um, and again, you want a lifeguard for every 25 athletes. Um, you want medical off the pool deck too. Additionally, um, we'll talk about having uh, waiting areas like we have at summer games at Towson, um, and you, you potentially need to have medical in there. You know, you, somebody falls down and scrapes a knee. Um, again, medical is one of the most important pieces of hosting a competition. 
And again, just a reminder note, you can't start a competition without medical on site. Um, sometimes I know at, at competitions, you may not be looking directly for medical until you need them. But again, you never want to start until medical personnel is directly on site for a competition. And Zach, if you can go back one, this is Steve. Um, yes, sir. One of the things that Zach hit on here, which I think is very important, obviously, with, with many other things, but the second bullet point here uh, with the officials, um, I can't tell you how many times I've gone uh, to qualifying events and sometimes at state championships with officials in the different sports. And it's really important, um, as it states here, to officiate and operate at the same standard at state games. So I highly recommend that you have a meeting with the officials, um, whether it's the morning of the event or leading up to the event, explaining to them the importance of enforcing the rules. Um, I know that some officials say, oh, this is Special Olympics. This is a, a great event. Uh, I feel good about doing it. I don't want to DQ anyone. I don't want to, um, you know, uh, take an award away or, or make an athlete feel bad. But what that does is that doesn't help the athlete improve um, and to realize what they're doing um, incorrectly. It also helps the coaches know what they need to work on and leading up to other events. Um, you know, in basketball and soccer and others, I've seen them say, oh, it's, it's, it's Special Olympics. I'll let that slide. Um, but really have them officiate it as it's a true uh, championship type of event. Um, it reemphasizes what the coaches have been working on with the athletes. So um, I just emphasize that to take a little bit of time to work with your officials and explain the importance of enforcing um, the rules uh, so that the athletes can continue to improve. Back to you, Zach. Thanks, Steve. That's a great note. Um, and to add to that, if you are having trouble having that conversation um, with a group of officials, um, Rob Daubry, who is our lead official for, for summer games, and he comes in for everything. Most of you should know Rob at this point. He is very good at having that conversation with his officials. So if you need help or resources or a person even just to, to say, hey, how do you have that conversation? My, my officials just, just don't seem to – they say yes, and they're not living that, though. Um, I think Rob is a great resource, and he's more than happy to help you guys out, too. Um, again. Rob and Neil, both of them are great resources. They have connections to other great resources. Um, as we move along the presentation, again, um, we will keep leaning on use your resources, um, use us for, for resources, um, and we can help you out for sure. So part one here, we're gonna talk a lot about the, the main preparation points for, for a competition. Um, there's some little nuances that we're, we're not gonna hit here or there. Um, sometimes they're facility specific, sometimes they're um, management team specific, and so on and so forth. But we want to give you the, the basic blocks of building and how to, you know, acquire a facility, build a games management team, and planning for registration and recruitment, uh, because those are the major building blocks of getting your competition up and running. So acquiring a facility, right? Acquiring a facility, quick mention in the, in the opener there, um, one of the toughest things, right? Especially for the sport of swimming, Pools are always in high demand. It seems like throughout the spring, they're almost impossible to get time for. Um, so, you know, it's, it's finding who has openings, who you have relationships with, what resources there are out there. Um, but so once you're looking for a facility, right, what are the questions that you need to ask to figure out if that facility is appropriate for your competition, right? So these are some of the questions that, that we ask ourselves as we're looking at a, a potential new facility. Step one, is the facility safe for, for my athletes and others? Safety includes, one, the pool is a, a up-to-date safe pool. Um, you know, it has access to get in and get out of the pool for various athletes. Um, they have, a, you see that they have lifeguards on site for, for standard swimming hours and stuff. So you know that they're prepared to host and have lifeguards that can take care of your needs. Um, does it have flow and availability for you to get from path A to path B? Um, you know, think of summer games with the, the, um, the gyms at Towson, right? How our athletes need to go from staging to the pool to awards, that that is a, a safe process and a, a, an open process for athletes to get through. Um, and even just think of the gyms at Towson, right? There is a place for athletes and, you know, by partners and families and teams that are waiting to go to. 
um, and then take another step even further of how can we set up these areas to be safe for our athletes? So, you know, it's, it's these are the basic questions, but there's, there's tiers to it that you have to work through and kind of think through those, those processes um, all the way down to the littlest thing, right? Um, does the facility have the means to accommodate the anticipated number of participants? So go, now let's, let's transition to Loyola. Um, we, we talked about Towson and facilitating the numbers that we had. You know, we worked out and changed some things there to make that happen. Looking at Loyola, there's a cap to how many athletes we can, we can bring in, not only from a standpoint of how many athletes we can get in a pool, run through the time frame that we have, but also that we can safely have in the building. If you've been to Loyola, you can tell that the gallery is a little, a little tight at times. Um, there is some standing room, but if there was an emergency, we could get folks out. There's enough doors to get people out from the gallery up there, and there's enough space that people could file out in a safe manner. Um, again, so safety is the number one thing for, for your athletes and everybody attending, which is the top two bullets here. Um, something that people don't think about all the time, um, and I at times have not thought about looking at a new facility, is does it meet the technological needs of our, our competition? Um, again, as we, we continue to progress here, new technologies come out, new things that we need, um, does the facility have wireless internet? Um, you know, that you can connect to? Does it have any form of internet that you can connect to that you may need to connect to? Um, technology for swimming, does it have a, a Dactronics Colorado system, right? Um, a timing system that you can use to keep the best times possible. Um, we don't use touch pads, um, so I would, I would, I won't say that you shouldn't use touch pads. Um, we have found it to be difficult at times using touch pads that not all athletes know that they're there or how to use them or how much pressure to apply. Uh, but we do use the handheld plungers to catch times as well. Um, and I mean, there, there could be a slew of other technological needs. Um, you know, we've talked about live streaming before. Does it have the, the bandwidth capacity to do live streaming? So on and so forth. Um, so as we continue to progress and new technologies come out, that's definitely one piece to think of uh, when appraising if that facility is correct for you. Um, does the facility have additional resources for you, right? Do they have equipment that you can borrow? Uh, do they have people that could be on your management team? Can they offer volunteers? Can they serve lunch? So on and so forth. Is that something that's a deal breaker for your facility, those things? No, not necessarily, but there are certain pieces of equipment that you may need that they need to have. If, if you are, are running a Dactronic system and, you know, they don't have the, the plungers um, or, or the touch pads in that case. Um, maybe, that, maybe that's not something that works for you. Uh, but those are all extra pieces to think about uh, when acquiring a facility. And those are kind of the base level pieces. Again, um, we talked through some of the more detailed pieces and there may be some nuanced pieces that you need specifically for your competition and event. Uh, but those are really the, the overlying top issues that you wanna check for. So question, so this is gonna be a, a raise your hand portion. Um, so for, for as we've been talking about this, right? What other factors in procuring a good facility for your competition might there be? Has anybody thought about something else as I was talking and said, Zach, we didn't, you didn't mention this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for participation here. And if somebody doesn't raise their hand, I'm gonna open up a line and ask a question. That's, don't give me this power. Do not give me this power to choose people and ask you questions. I'm looking for a hand. While, while Zach's looking for a hand, I'll, I'll, I'll start it with, with kind of goes hand in hand. And one comment is, which I know we talk about later in the presentation, but um, one of the factors is when you're, when you're talking to the facilities, you guys may know this, but I've been burned um, through my many years of, of event management is, once you talk to the facility and, and you have a handshake agreement or a verbal agreement, very beneficial to have something in writing, even if it's just a quick one pager, you have the use of the facility from on this date, from this time to this time. Uh, I've been burned where there has been a transition with the person I had the agreement with, um, got another job and did not pass along our agreement uh, to the next person. So to get something in writing and then also um, I've known people who have gotten a situation where, hey, the agreement's in place and it's in writing and signed and that's great. 
nothing's talked about in regards to the cost. And then a um, week after the event, you get an invoice in the mail and you're like, wait a minute, I didn't know it was going to cost this much, whether it was lifeguards, uh, the uh, janitorial crews or whatever. Um, so again, always ask that question is let's talk. Is there a cost or can you waive the cost? I always start with, can you waive the cost for Special Olympics as a nonprofit? Um, as you guys well know, there are a lot of people out there who will do that. And then just ask for very nominal fees if it's uh, the ones that they have to out of pocket have, which again is the lifeguard and janitorial crew. So I'll pass it back to Zach. Looks like we have one or two hands raised. All right, so we do have one hand and it is, it is Deborah. Let's see if we can get Deborah's line open here. Why is it giving me trouble letting Deborah on? Hmm. Deborah, I'm gonna I'm gonna work to get your line open. Um, but until then, um, I am going to. Ah, uh, here we go. Lower hand, unmute. And Deborah, Deborah, it doesn't look like you have called in. Deborah, can you do me a favor and type your question into the chat? Um, we will pick your question up from chat, and I will see if I can get your, your audio running. Um, but in the meantime, I am now going to call on somebody, and that is going to be Miss, Miss Anna Eiler, who's on our, our SMT. What, what other good facility pieces that do you need to figure out for your swim competitions? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, just want to make sure. So what I look for is for the athletes that have not even athletes that are in a wheelchair, but even if they just are not able to walk long distances where you hold your athletes and where the pool facility is, you have to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a huge piece, right? Some of our athletes have ambulatory issues. Um, that need assistance getting into a pool. Um, it depends on what pool you are, are using, right? So um, if you look at Towson, Towson's got really tall sidewalls, right? So it, it's tough for some of our athletes to get in, even with the, the stairs um, and the, the regular ladders to get in. Um, they have the lift though, right? So that may be one of the things that you need to look for is, I know that I'm gonna have an athlete that has an issue getting in and out of the pool, I need access to a lift if I, if I have a, a pool set up like Towson. But if you go to Loyola, they do have the, the, the wider, bigger stairs that are, are less treacherous to walk down. Um, so while they do have a lift there, in case we do need it, um, a lot of our athletes can use those stairs. So that's, that's a huge one. That's a great one, Anna. All right, I'm gonna remute Anna. Um, and then, and Deborah did type into the chat. Um, she said, how about conflict in parking space availability? That's a huge one too, right? So knowing how many people are going to come, you can kind of crystal ball how many cars may come. Some people may carpool, some people may come individually. Um, but you know, you, you want to overshoot your parking. You know, again, we're going to reference Towson and Loyola here. Towson, Towson, we have a whole parking deck. Um, worst case scenario, if somehow in some way we filled up that parking deck, there's another parking deck that has a little bit of a walk attached to it. Um, then on top of that too, there's drop off areas out front that, you know, if somebody needs to drop off, they can drop off and the walk's a lot shorter. So that's the thing. But so that's one of the things that if you go to a facility and you say, well, the pool's great. They have a gym that we can put people in, but man, I don't know about parking. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question, um, Deborah, and if you can type back your answer in the chat now, now that I know you, you got that chat rolling. Um, if you have a facility that has parking that's questionable, the pool's great, they have a gym space for you guys to set up in, um, do you have other options parking-wise that you could potentially do uh, to, to navigate that issue that you've run into? And while, while Deborah's looking at uh, answering that question, one of the things I'll, I'll piggyback on this question is, 
Um, in talking with the facilities, always ask uh, uh, several questions when you're doing a site visit and determining if the facility is available. I know whether it's a park and rec uh, facility or a school facility is, hey, everything looks great. There's a huge parking lot. No problem. Then you show up and there's a field hockey tournament going on or a basketball tournament going on, um, which <laughs> drains up a lot of the parking that you thought would be available to you. So I always ask, are there any other events that will be happening um, on campus or at the venue during our, our uh, competition? Um, and also, are there any other construction that's, that's um, anticipated to be going on? So always ask those questions. Um, you know, it, it helps to determine, again, the parking and other, other factors. We've, we've run into a situation where we show up at a basketball gym and the band is having performance or practice in the room that we had held for our control center. And so we had to make some makeshift opportunities right there at the, at the beginning of the day. So always work with your facility and ask those important questions. Uh, back to you, Zach. Yeah, that, that's a great ad. Um, I've been burned by that myself. So I think as you do more of these, you run into those experiences and, and learn from those lessons. Um, but Deborah had a, a really good follow-up. She said, uh, bus shuttles to the facility are parking attendants available. Um, both are really good options. Um, just as a good example, I mean, bus shuttles, we did that with Polar Plunge this year. Polar Plunge is a massive event, and we have a ton of parking there, but still there ends up being a certain point where, you know, there, there's overflow parking. Um, so I think those are two really good options. Um, and again, it could be as simple as just asking the facility, hey, when you guys have big events, um, where else do you park people? They may already have, heck, they may have a, a deal worked out with Walmart across the street that they, they let people park in the parking lot there um, as long as Walmart knows a month in advance or something. Um, so like Steve said, I think the major thing when it comes to facilities and figuring out the, the what works and what doesn't work is just have good conversation with the facility managers. Um, something we'll talk about more as we go along the line and we'll probably reference a couple of times even prior to talking is, is building that relationship with your, your facility, right? Um, the folks that are there, they're going to be working tremendously hard to make that event happen for you guys. Um, and so as long as you guys can build that relationship of, hey, we have a, a request. Is this possible? Great. Hey, what do you need? What can we do for you? Um, you know, they have a request. Hey, can you guys come in, you know, 10 minutes later, we're, we're switching over from a, a band practice, like Steve said, um, we just need a few more minutes to clear people out. Sure, we'll give you those 10 minutes. You gave us the extra parking. We're in really good shape here. Um, but so, and I, I, just some other one, one of the other, one of, let me, yeah, yeah, Zach, one more, one more point there is um, some of you know me, some of you don't, but uh, a little bit of background. I've been in the event industry for 25 years. Um, run uh, from the Olympics to Special Olympics World Games and USA Games and state games and everything like that. Now, when I, I still go into a facility, and the first, the first thing I do is I sit down with them and I say, here's what, what we need in order to host this competition, whether it's the space that's needed, the flow that's needed, or whatever. And I ask them, how would you do it? Now, I have the experience what I think may work best but they're the ones who live and breathe that facility every day and they've, they've gone through it and you can, you can suggest things here and there, but always ask them, how would you do this? Where would you have these things set up? Um, again, they live and breathe that facility every day. I'm sure they've tried many different avenues and they probably have a, a good working system in place. So always lean on them, you know, ask the question, where would you put this? How would you do this um, to get their expertise in that? Back to you, Zach. Great point, Steve. Thanks for adding that. Um, and then again, a lot of these things we discussed, um, extra parking, pool accessibility, peripheral space as in a, a gym to have teams waiting in, um, venue traffic flow, loading and offloading area for, for athletes and even yourself to get equipment inside. Um, additional rooms, you know, how many restrooms, you know, what's the accessibility for restrooms, locker rooms, spectator seating in the gallery. Um, where can we put our staging area, uh, a lounge slash quiet room area, um, those extra things, um, starting blocks, timing systems, any of the swim oriented equipment that you may need are good things to ask when you have that initial meeting. So next question that I'm going to ask people for, um, and again, so 
what what pieces of a think of a, a swim competition what's non-negotiable what when you have that first meeting and you're asking and talking about things what are the pieces that they say oh we don't have that we can't do that that unfortunately may be a deal breaker for that facility we'll wait for a, a question or two um and unfortunately with, with facilities sometimes and, and uh proposing this you know Sometimes you're going to have a facility where it just doesn't work. Um, sometimes you're going to have some things where it's out of your price range, right? That that could be a, a, a non-negotiable thing for you guys. Um, if I don't get a hand, don't don't make me pick on somebody again. I will pick on somebody no problem. And it, it won't be Anna or Debbie this time. So you know who the rest of you are. All right. Miss Katie Sheeman. What are, what are some of our, our non-negotiable factors for a swimming facility? I've got you unmuted. You may be muted on your end as well. Uh-oh, Katie might have looked out. I might have to move on to my next person. Oh. Oh, Deborah's got another question. Deborah, if you could if you could type that question in again, um, I, we're still working on the back end to get you um, voice activation at this point. All right, my next person that I'm calling on is Miss Ruth. Ruth, what what is what is a non-negotiable factor when you're looking for a swimming facility? Am I unmuted? Oh, yep, you're unmuted. Okay, a non-negotiable? Yep, something that you have to have to make that competition happen. Well, you've got to make sure you've got a big enough pool to accommodate all the people you want. You've got to make sure you've got the right number to go into the pool. Right, yeah, so so one thing that I've seen people run into is, is they talk to a facility and they're only going to be allotted three lanes. Uh, yeah, we, we can have you on that day. We'd love to have you, but we can only give you three out of six lanes. We have a, a lifeguard training going on that same day. Well, then we scratch. Well, yeah, go ahead, Ruth. Well, I mean, we scratch that idea, that facility, and move on somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. Or, well, I mean, or maybe check and see if there's another day that you can work out potentially. But, but so if you only, I mean, it's going to take you forever to use three lanes, you know. Um, so it's one of those things that three lanes is going to be too tough for you. Um, anything else, Ruth, before I, I mute you again? No, I think that would be the biggest issue. And also trying to have a facility big enough to, certain facilities should just be held for the smaller events. And other facilities held for the long ones that are 16, 20, 30 lanes. You know, we need mm -hmm. to make sure we can put our needs into the right pool and make everything work without being there yeah. for 48 hours. Yeah, again, thinking about the events that we offer and the, the style of pool, um, most of the times in most schools you'll see, uh, I think they're 25 yard, not meter technically, um, or, or 50 uh, yard slash meter pools. Um, occasionally you'll find a, a very odd pool, uh, an Olympic sized training pool, something like that. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the events that we offer our athletes, is that pool appropriate to facilitate those events? Um, we did get a couple of type ins from, from Deborah and Shelby. Um, first, I'll hit Deborah. Um, no medical team. Um, so, with no medical team, you know, that's, that's tough. It's, it's something that maybe the facility isn't in charge of providing for you. Um, I think. I think if they they say no lifeguards, that may be more of a question on the facilities end of it. Um, but for medical, um, there may be some outside sources that you could bring in medical to assist with. Um, there probably is outside sources that you could bring in lifeguards with too. But more times than not, you want your lifeguards to be acquainted with that pool. Um, but no, the, the medical is a huge one, right? You've got to have medical on site to start any event. Um, and for the safety of your athletes. So if, if that can't happen at that facility for some reason, that'd be a big deal breaker. Um, Shelby has another really good one, accessibility, right? Accessibility, we talked about being able to get into the pool, right? Some of our athletes need assistance getting into the pool. But I mean, think about accessibility. If if you have a, a high school that you're running your, your meet at and the the pool is in the basement 
and the gym is upstairs and there's no elevator and you have some athletes that um, can't get into the pool um, from the stairs, the stairs are the complication there, that may not work for you guys, right? Um, even, if, even if it's all on the same floor, if the, the gym's on you know, one side of the school and the pool's on the other side of the school, that could be a really long trek for, for your athletes. Um, you know, even at Towson, we see at times the trip from staging and gym three around the pool that can be a little bit of a trek. Um, so anything more than that could be a little treacherous for your athlete. Uh, so that was a very good one too. Thanks, Shelby. Um, Anna, we have another one for you here. Your line is open, Anna. I just wanted to add, so there are some facilities that have more than one pool. So you may get mm -hmm. one whole six lanes to yourself. But just be cognizant of what's going on if there is a second pool that's like on the same deck. So you brought up lifeguarding classes. They use, mm -hmm. depending on the instructor, they can use whistles a lot. And for noise sensitive athletes, that's a no go. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. Again, that's, that's going back to what Steve said, you know, asking those questions of, hey, if we're going to have this, this day, you know, everything looks good. Is there anything else scheduled for that day? Is there anything that we should know about? I don't know if you'll be able to get them to, you know, not have that training, uh, but you may be able to prepare your athletes or whomever may be coming in with you, um, or you may make that decision at that point to say, hey, um, we're, we're not going to have the competition on that day because of that going on. Um, what's the next weekend look like? Great. There's nothing going on. Let's move it to next weekend. So that's a really good point to bring up uh, the environment, right? What's the environment going to be like for your athletes? Um, anything else, Anna, before I mute you again? That's all. Perfect. Thank you. So going back to our, our slides here, again, talk about safety, medical, lifeguards, uh, pool accessibility, uh, staging area, right? Where's that, that gym access or open area that you can stage athletes to get them to the pool deck? Um, space and time available, environment. Again, there's, there's a lot of things that can go into it. There may be some unique nuances. Um, like Anna said, they may have a facility where there are two pools and two things going on. Um, you know, so it may depend on each facility as well. I think with, with that I one, another one. You got, you got one for us, Steve? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, when you look at the pool and everything, again, asking those, those detailed questions is, depending on what events you're offering, whether it's, you know, if you're offering the, the lower ability or the fundamental events, you know, the assisted swims and that type of thing, look at the depth of the pool. Um, sometimes the, there are some pools now that are, you know, eight to 10 feet deep, the entire length of the pool. Well, if you have your assisted um, personnel helping the, help and assist the athletes and they're treading the whole time, that may be very difficult. So that may be a factor you take into consideration regarding what events you do offer at your, uh, at your event. Great note. Thanks for that one, Steve. Um, yeah, every pool is going to be different. Um, so again, again, that conversation with that facility, um, you don't want to be too overbearing or anything up front, but you, you want to be realistic about what your needs are, like Steve said. Um, and at the same time, the facility doesn't want their time wasted either. So if they can't help you and facilitate what you're trying to do, you know, that's the conversation you want to have. Um, last question set here. Um, what are, what are some factors that you, you can work around and or supplement in some way? So there are some things sometimes when you have a conversation that, you know, here's what the facility has. It might not be perfect or ideal, um, but, you know, we can do this to move around it. Um, anybody have anything that they can think of of something that, you know, is something that isn't a total deal breaker that you can be flexible on? Because flexibility is a huge part of making it through your competition um, and finding a facility that suits your needs um that that'll be right for your athletes and everybody participating looking for hands you can type into chat too again if, if you're having audio issues um chat i can definitely see everything um so so one one of them to potentially jog people's um thought processes here um is that you know, we talked about accessibility, right? Um, you know, in, in the past, we used to bring the, um, the, the white stairs that you put in the water and you have to put sandbags in in the pool um, at, at Towson. Um, 
And so last year we decided to make the move because they have a list. They have a good list that's accessible for our athletes, um, which quite honestly is safer, safer than those white stairs. I think those those white stairs are absolutely horrifying and scare me trying to walk in on them. Um, if you don't have a bunch of support with people standing in the pool holding them, um, and they take a long time to get in and out. So we decided to make that move to that lift. Um, and so we, we had some athletes that hadn't been used to the lift before, um, but we negotiated that, that process of moving forward with the lift as our, our standard for those athletes. And once they got in and used it and we had somebody there to support them to do it, that's, that was a, a something that we could work around to, to make the event better, um, make it a little bit quicker, make it a little bit safer experience for our athletes, um, that we didn't have to, to bring in the stairs and figure out where to put them in the facility because there's not a good spot to put them on the deck. Um, so that's one. Um, anything else anyone can think of? All right, I, I'm gonna give you these ones. You guys have been good. I've appreciated you guys chiming in and giving us. So, so here's some awards. Where are you gonna put awards, right? So we've been talking about where we're gonna put our athletes while they're waiting, where we're gonna put the athletes while they're staging, where are we gonna put them on the pool deck? Where are we, is the pool good? You know, is there a gallery? But where are you gonna have awards? That's potentially a whole nother room that you may need to use um, and figure out where that's gonna go. Equipment, what equipment do they have? Um, you know, do they have kickboards and stuff? Do they have flotation devices that can be used? Um, are those a deal breaker if they don't have them? Probably not. You guys probably have equipment or maybe you can borrow it from somewhere. Um, timing system. We'd love to everybody be using a, a Dactronics Colorado timing system. Um, not everybody, one, knows how to use them. Two, not everybody necessarily has them. Um, so again, using stopwatches is a viable way to go. Um, it's something that you can do. It's something that we do as we double and triple down on collecting time. Um, food services for lunch. Um, you know, if you're going to offer lunch, if it's a full day event and that facility doesn't offer food on site, they don't have a cafeteria, they don't have somebody that can make, you know, 250 lunches and bring them into you, not necessarily a deal breaker. You could potentially have somebody else, you know, Wawa, um, any of the grocery stores in your area. They're, they're very willing to do those kind of things. So it doesn't mean that the facility itself has to have that. Um, officials and management team snacks. Um, sometimes facilities may be nice and have those things for you. Sometimes they'll, they'll sell them as part of the lunch services that you can have. If not, there's always Costco's and BJ's and Sam's Club. You can take a trip and fill up a bin. Um, that's one of our, our volunteer director's favorite things to do. Sam loves ordering snacks and picking up snacks for our volunteers. So if you ever need help, She's got plenty of great recommendations. Um, water, I do not mean water in the pool. If there's no water in the pool, you have a major problem that is a deal breaker. Um, but when I talk about water, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, filling those water jugs and stuff like that, having bottled water on site. Um, most facilities will have somewhere for you to fill up on water, a trainer's room. Um, I don't recommend using the hose outside or anything like that, um, but, but if you need water and it's gonna be something throughout the day, it may just be have, have to be something that you plan for or, or bring in yourself. Um, again, very rare do you run into a case where you don't have water on site. Um, Steve, any other unique things that you can think of that are non-deal breakers that may pop up? No, I think they're uh, just, just hitting the food services, um, you know, with, with basketball and some other of our events, whether it's at a, at a high school or a parks and rec, um, they do have concessions. Um, ask them if they'd be willing to open those. And, um, you know, if there's no options there, don't think that, oh, my gosh, I've got to provide lunch for everybody. You can tell people lunch is on your own. Bring your own. Um, but if you do that, just make sure the facility um, gives you the okay to bring in your own lunch. And then um, the question then is, are there enough trash receptacles um, and liners? And if there's not janitorial crews, um, available and you and your management team are in charge of the the waste management pieces make sure that either they provide you with the waste receptacles and the liners or that uh, you you put that in your budget and on your equipment list to bring in good point um, another very little point that does come up with facilities at time um, more more times than not it comes up with college facilities um, and Steve, you can correct me if I have this backwards, but for Towson, they are a Pepsi facility. There's no Coke products on site unless it's approved through a, a special situation where they, there's a written note 
and all sorts of other things happen. Um, so, you know, if, if they see Coke on site that's not approved, uh, they will swoop in and steal your Coke products with the Pepsi police, um, and that's a no-go. Um, then, then on the other hand, uh, Loyola, I believe they're a Pepsi school as well. Um, they're, they're no Coke products as well, but their process of approving Coke products because we do get Coke donations is, is looser than thousands. Um, so that's something to talk through. If you're going to get a donation, um, talk through that with your facility. Make sure it's okay. Um, I have very rarely run into a situation where the facility says, hey, like, that's a, not okay. You can't do that. We know you're getting it donated. Um, you know, one, well, you see it with bowling, right? Um, quick, quick side story. California, when I was working out there, bowling, it, it was warm enough in the fall that you could have stuff outside, you know, check in outside and stuff like that because you know how packed the bowling house gets. And so we, we had nights at Columbus or somebody going to do lunches, but you can't bring in food to a bowling alley. It's just, it's all, that's how it is everywhere. We worked out a deal that we set up a tent outside and we did lunch outside. Um, again, so it's, it's a workaround that we figured out. It's something that you could supplement in some way. Um, so there definitely are things that you can be flexible on when it comes to your event and making it happen. We talked about facility relationship and support, right? A strong, mutually beneficial relationship with a facility gets you a really, really long way and gets a lot out of your event. Um, again, ask yourself if there's something that you can provide for them. It, it may be something as small as like we talked about is coming in five minutes later, 10 minutes later for something like that to help them out. That does a tremendous thing for your relationship with the facility. Um, and then when you have a good relationship with your facility, when you need something, it, it, may, it might be at your event, you know, something happened, you need something. If you have a good relationship, those are the times where that relationship shines and they will traditionally hop right on it. Um, uh, a reference to, to summer games again, uh, for folks that can't climb the stairs into the gallery, there is a lift to go up into the gallery. And that's one of those things that as it pops up, we radio cows and staff and they run right over and make it happen. Um, so again, that's just a really good relationship with them. I'm sure we can be annoying and, and call them at inopportune times. But, you know, we've built that relationship and we've, we've worked with them and we've fostered that relationship to the point where they say, you know what, I'm going to put this down for two seconds, run over there, get that person on the list and get them up and then I'll come back. Um, again, you will get the most out of your event if you get that facility to buy into what Special Olympics does and they're not just offering a place to happen. That, that's a really special relationship and a really special partnership for you and your athletes, you know. When those people look year after year for, for you guys and your athletes to come back, that's when you know you've built something that, that really shines and is going to do a lot for you down the road. Um, a really good example of that has, has been Towson as well. Um, I, I mean, there's times throughout the year that we're on campus. I mean, just look at the um, swim clinics that we do with Coach Trump. Him and his athletes look forward to that stuff out of season. It's not summer games but they don't care. They're really excited to have us at their pool. Um, again, so that relationship and support both ways, those are a huge support system for your event and your ability to operate that event. Building a games management team. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard us say GMT games management team uh, a bunch of times. Some of you guys may have games management teams already rocking and rolling for some of your sports, which is awesome. Um, but who can give me uh, a, a loose definition of what a games management team is. Anybody? I'm looking for those hands to go up. If not, I will. I will call on somebody and I will ask for your definition. All right, let's go with. Let's go with. Josie, I unmuted you. Do you, you have a loose definition for us for what a games management team is? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? I got you. We're good. All right. I would say just a team that's ready to help you throughout the whole process and always, like, have your back, basically. Yeah, no, I, that's a, a perfect definition of that. Um, so we, we've defined it kind of as a, a as the group of sports-knowledgeable volunteers that help facilitate your competition from start to finish, like you said, through the whole process. Um, they're involved in the planning process, the competition itself, and the evaluation after. 
Um, it's also comp, uh, comp comprised <laughs> of other lead volunteers that are not necessarily sports knowledgeable, that serve in roles such as registration, food services, logistics, medical, volunteer services, so on and so forth. So, so that was a perfect definition, right? Um, so games management team, it's something that, that um, Steve is a big believer in um, through all of his stops. He, he's really made a lot of it happen um, with the help of Mike Sarnowski and a bunch of other people across the state. Um, our games management team for summer games is how many people strong, Steve, at this point? Uh, not, not considering the committees that are kind of a sub factor on the games management team. You know, I would say 30 to 35 individuals that um, are, are overseeing in a leadership capacity in all the different functional areas from the sports to all the support services, as you see on the, on the second bullet point. Um, the other thing is, is um, that's not mentioned here, but we always, whenever possible, we, we invite and strongly suggest having a member of the facility who's hosting the competition be on that games management team. Um, as a games management team, you guys have meetings and you have uh, you talk about processes and and how you want to set things up. Um, it's very valuable to have an individual from that facility on the team um, that can guide you or stop you in your tracks if you're doing something that they know won't work or is not available. So um, the other thing is these are people who who you need to to have that to to talk with them prior to. Make sure they're dedicated and ask them what their, their time availability is and then delegate, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but delegate roles and responsibilities and, and hold them accountable and delegate those responsibilities so they have that meaningful involvement and feel that they are a major contributor. Otherwise, you know, why are they volunteering? So um, that's what they want to do and they want to feel a valued member, feel as if they're a valued member of your team. So back to you, Zach. Yeah, and, and as Steve's talking about it, um, again, you, you want the GMT to be able to make decisions on behalf of the competition um, and the area, um, again, after appropriate training and onboarding and, and giving them the, the information that they need to make those decisions um, and, know, and, and that they know the limits of their decision-making authority. You want to empower your games management team to make decisions, and, and so it's not one person, whoever is the games director or or the area director or the, the sports coordinator, whomever it may be leading the competition, you want your, your games management team to, they put in all those hours, they come to meetings, they've been part of the planning, they have all the information, let them make those decisions so that, that whoever the games director may be or overseeing the event can kind of move around and, and hit other pieces that may need assistance. Um, I mean, most of you guys have, have been to summer games, you've seen um, Neil's team. Um, Neil is our overall games director for swimming. Um, of course, I'm the, the SOMD liaison for that at that point. Um, but I mean, he's got his team, Kevin at over in staging, Sharon over in staging, helping with all the staging, Jim Myrick on the pool deck, Rob Dobry with the officials. Um, you know, you have all those pieces moving and those folks have been empowered to handle those pieces and do their thing. If they have a question or a need, you know, they may call Neil over uh, for some advice or assistance to see what he thinks. Neil may call me over. We may have a group chat about it. But they've all been empowered to, to know their, their positions, know their roles, and make decisions as they need to make it to make the event better as you go along. So positions that make up a GMT. These are what we are recommending. Um, they are not definitively you have to have these positions or you know, you, you have to have them in this order or that there needs to be one person per position. Um, if there's certain positions that somebody can pull double duty and it's within their skill set to man manage that double duty and it's not going to wear them out too, um, that's, that's a viable option. Um, but so the positions that we kind of recommend is that, that swimming event director, again, think Neil at Summer Games. Director of officials, again, think Rob Dobry for Summer Games. Staging manager is going to be Sharon or is um, Tracy for summer games. I don't know if all of you have met Tracy because Tracy's always a ru running around like crazy on the pool deck. Um, staging manager in the staging area is Sharon Myrick. Uh, your, your pool director is going to be Jim Myrick. Um, timing manager is another one of our, our lead officials. His name is Tim Hudson. 
Um, if you've ever walked in the side door to get to the pool, he sits in the exact opposite side door. Um, an awards director, um, a staging manager, potentially for awards if you want to have two people on that, um, a volunteer manager checking in volunteers um, if they come in the morning, dispersing them where they need to go for training, um, somebody potentially checking in volunteers throughout the day, um, and then some additional rules to, con or, uh, roles to consider um, depending on the event that you're offering. Like Steve mentioned, having the facility manager on your GMT is great. It's a huge benefit to your team. Um, like Steve said, you may have an idea and you guys are going and you guys think it's great, but the facility can't handle it or it won't work for that facility. Then they can step in and be like, guys, it's a great idea, but uh, it's just not going to work. We need to look at it a different way, potentially. Um, food services manager, if you are providing lunches uh, during the day, it's great to have somebody focusing that uh, on that individually. Um, you guys have been to plenty of events. When lunch gets opened, you know how that can get at times. It can get a little uh, crazy, a little packed, depending on how you facilitate lunch. Um, so having a food service manager and a team for them is great. Um, and then a logistics director. If you have uh, a facility where you may need somebody running around filling water jugs and, you know, uh, bringing chairs to different places and double checking on things like that, it may not hurt to have a logistics director. Um, swimming is a little bit more compact, so you may not need that um, in such a big team, but it definitely helps to have. Zach, this is Mike. Just uh, one thing to add with yeah. this. Um, you look at this and you see what nine, twelve roles there. Um, the uh, the the whether we're talking the swimming games management team at Summer Games or uh, the track management team, which I developed and Ron uh, Freeman has expanded beyond. It wasn't snapping the fingers and all those people were in those positions. It was built up over time. Uh, and finding the right people for the right role um, uh, with that. So don't uh, don't be intimidated here. If you even if you think you you need all twelve positions, if you can't get all of them, just make sure that the responsibilities are covered. And while you're doing that, look at the volunteers who are at your event, and think who could possibly move up and take on more responsibility, uh, and would be effective and appropriate there. Um, but I know anytime you look at something this big. It, it can just be overwhelming of, oh my God, where am I going to get all these people? Um, uh, every bit of them, oh, we're talking the, the, the swimming management team, the track management team, the overall summer games management team, they were all built up uh, person by person um, over years uh, and, uh, and did a great job of, of uh, retaining those folks. So that's all. Mike, thanks for that ad. Um, that was a great point. Um, like Mike said, you're, you're not going to necessarily have all these out of the gate. Um, you want to have people overseeing them. Um, but Mike made a, a really important point of, as you host your event, take a look at those potential day of volunteers that come through. If, some, if somebody's standing out and you're like, wow, they're doing a great job, you know, get their contact information, start that conversation of, hey, is this something that you'd like to do every year? We need a, we need a, a volunteer manager. Um, would you like to come in now that you've had that experience and, and take the lead of, we need volunteers here, here, and here. Um, you know, I need these people to move and handle that. Um, you know, that's, that's a really great point to make. There's people that come to your events every time that can be great for that. Um, so the transition, yes. we, we just talked. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. I was just going to add, um, piggybacking on what Mike and Zach were both saying, as you build up these teams, it's not an overnight process for sure. But uh, I know some of you are, um, in the volunteer role for sure, and think about how you 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 were recruited. And always, when we start developing brand new teams, it's you know you try to get one or two or possibly three really good people, and then you say, okay, guys, I need you guys to go find one person each. And then it can be their family, it can be their neighbors, it can be acquaintances from work that they've met or whatever that may have an interest in it, and you start that pyramid building. So you recruit one or two to three people. They each recruit one person, and now you have six. And then they each recruit one, and now you have nine or 12 or whatever. So uh, I just think it's important, like Mike said, don't be overwhelmed. It does happen over time, but you've got to start somewhere. So back to you, Zach. All right. Um, and with all this talk of, of recruitment, right, um, 
I'm going to throw out the question to you guys. So if you want to raise your hand, type into the chat um, what you may think about this. Where, where are some places that you can look to recruit for these positions? Um, you know, uh, Steve mentioned, you know, there may be people that you work with, maybe people that you, you know um, from other places. What are some of those other places that might be a good place to recruit folks for for your competition? Sorry, I kind of blew it there, didn't I, Zach? I gave a little helpful hint. My bad. That's okay. That's okay. It's, I, I like giving a little hint because it, it jogs the, the brain power and gets everybody thinking, gets them right on track. So let's let's see here. No hands yet. If I don't get a hand, I'm gonna call on somebody. You know how this system goes. Let's see. Who am I gonna pick before somebody raises a hand? I'm gonna pick let's let's see if we can try this again. Katie, I unmuted you. Can we are you there? Can we get you talking? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I'm we here. got her. <laughs> Parents. Parents, that's a good one. Um, what, what about what about when you guys hold your event at the the Naval Academy? Okay. Where where do you guys get your most of your volunteers from? Uh, we get a lot of volunteers from the uh, the midshipmen and the JCs. Uh, so you can we also have sometimes you can use uh, uh, I can't think of uh, one of the groups. Oh, I yeah, no. Uh, Knights of Columbus. Now, there you go. Like there you go. Yeah, no. So, so those are perfect, right? So, so they feel like they're technically part of the facility when you're talking about the Naval Academy and the midshipmen and stuff. But those, those are really community and, and service groups, right? Um, the the Knights of Columbus is a great addition. Um, you know, civil service groups. They're always looking to volunteer. They're always looking to get involved. Um, a lot of them are involved in different events across the state, so they may be ready to go already, um, and they're, they're a great resource to tap into. Thanks, Katie. Quite welcome. All right, Deborah. Let, let me see if I can... I'm going to try something to get your audio. Let me see... Deborah, I still don't have your audio, um, so if you could chat in again. I don't know if we're going to get you. I tried to make you uh, a, even a co-host. Um, oh, perfect. Deborah comes in with church groups. Again, perfect. Community groups, right? People that you've already built relationships with that at that point, you know, it's, it might be asking another thing that, that you've asked a bunch of things for, but, you know, they've already said yeah to a lot of things. You guys do a lot of things together already. So, you know, maybe this is something else that can give them another unique experience. Um, let's take a look here. Oh, let me go back quick. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to peek someone's um, thought process here. Think about your county program and where you get money from to sustain your program throughout the year. Yep. Who, somebody, somebody's got to have that one. That was a hint of where you could get volunteers from. Somebody's Some, got to be picking up that button down. I'm gonna have to call on somebody because I know I know somebody has the answer to that. Pick pick on one uh, of those that just has a phone number. That oh there there is a whole bunch of phone number people. I don't even know who this is gonna be so. I have opened up the phone number of 410 and ends in 3100. You have an open mic to answer now. Oh, we might not have a microphone on that one. Um, let's see. I'm going to make another pick. Let's see if we get from this phone number. The last four digits of your phone number is 3856. I'm not sure who you are. Oh, do we not have someone there either? All right, well, I guess I'm gonna have to pick on somebody with a name. You're all sticking out now. I'm going to pick, let's see. Josie, I'm picking you again. For, for Steve's, Steve threw out there, people that donate money to the program throughout the year, who could those be that could help you um, fill in your, your GMT or general volunteers, quite honestly? Hi. So 
Um, I was thinking even before you said that, I am still in high school, so I'm on a swim team. And I'll, I was thinking members of the swim team would be willing to volunteer. And also they would understand the process. So that would be a good pick for volunteers. That's, that's perfect. Like for, especially for day of volunteers, I think that's the dream, right? To have people that know the sport, that live the sport day in and day out. People that can be your timers that understand when to stop that stopwatch. Um, you know, people that know how to get to the pool and help athletes potentially get into the pool. Um, that's a perfect one. We try to bring in swim, the swim team as much as possible. Um, unfortunately, you know, summer games, Towson, a lot of the times their swim team is away. Um, they're off for the summer break. Um, but if you have ever been to Loyola, most of the, the young men and women that are joining us there for volunteers day of our, uh, men's and women's swim team, which is awesome. Uh, I think we do get the lacrosse team out as well. Um, but that's great. Any idea of what, what Steve was talking about, though, when he was talking about people that donate money and stuff? Um, I'm not 100% sure on that one. I'm not really sure. Okay, yeah. that's okay. All right. Well, thank you for the addition of the swim team because that's a huge one. All right. Uh, well, then I'm going to ask Miss, Miss Ruth Vickers if she knows what Steve's talking about with people that are donating money that might be good for recruiting GMT or general volunteers. We have a small core of parents that donate a couple hundred dollars here and there. We don't have any great big donations, but those should be people to tap to if they know somebody that knows somebody. Yeah. So, so I mean, again, they're, they're obviously – anybody that's donating money to the program um, is invested, right? So they're, they're a good resource to reach out to just from an investment standpoint. Um, so thanks for, for chiming in on that one, Ruth. Any, any other thoughts from anybody? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an, the, what I was kind of going for. Is, you know, I know some programs are better better um, financially than others, but um, it, it's really beneficial if um, we've done a great job with recruiting some of the sponsors at the state level to say, hey, thank you for your money. We'd also like to engage you um, to feel a part and see what your money is going for. And that's done two things. It's, it's um, engaged those people from those um, companies to come and see what their money is going for. And then they, they sometimes even raise their money donation or they become part of the management team and go back and recruit more, more of their fellow coworkers. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's really a win-win. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I was going for. But again, like Ruth said, anybody who's donating money has a vested interest in the program and say, hey, we're looking for some some help, and also others who don't give money. I can't. I don't have any money this year, but what else can I help with? There you go. We're looking for volunteers. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And, and a, a really quick example of that is is Plunge, right? We have a huge event down there at Sandy Point State Park, um, and so they actually came to us last year about holding a qualifier for Anne Arundel for cycling at Sandy Point State Park. Long story short, the the uh, park rangers that do so much for us down there to make plunge happen finally got to see a competition and so when plunge rolled back around again this year they were like we know what it's about now we've seen the competition this is absolutely awesome so i'm a hundred percent on board so you never know again those people that are making investments in other ways um they may be the ones that that you want to contact for bringing into the program uh bringing into your gmt bringing into your day of volunteers and then potentially bringing them up to GMT at some point. Um, some quick do's and don'ts for GMTs, right? The, there's a lot of information going around. Um, working through the do's really quick. Um, recruit volunteers to be your GMT members. Don't rely on your coaches to run your meet. Um, ideally, you want your coaches to coach at the meet. Um, you want them to get that experience of being at a competition as well, so they're ready to go to, to higher levels of competition. Um, you know, you may have uh, one coach or here or there that may be, you know, maybe your competition director or something, but you don't want to fill out your whole games management team with all your coaches because then you don't have coaches to coach your team during that competition. Um, again, we talked about empowering your GMT to, to take uh, the lead day of. Uh, and again, so you can help oversee the event and the team and kind of help as pieces are needed here or there. Um, you want to let them make decisions and be empowered with information to make decisions. Um, again, 
if, if you are going to have your head coach be part of your GMT, empower your assistant coaches to take that next step up and, and lead your team. Let them get an experience of, of taking the, the reins of the team and, and calling the shots for that day, right? You know, you may have laid out some things as the head coach that need to be done, uh, but if decisions need to be made for your team, maybe that's something that they can handle at that point. Um, again, uh, and then at that point, you know, that's going to have them take the next step in potentially getting certified and being on one of these, these uh, coaches' trainings. Um, set meetings prior to competition to talk through topics such as flow, changes from last year, goals for this year, um, new facilities, things that you want to tweak at the facility. Um, again, you want to have a couple meetings leading up to your competition. Uh, so everybody's on the same page. Everybody has that informa information that they can be empowered with day of at the event. Um, and then look at what key responsibilities are um, and matching the necessary skills to recruit people accordingly. Um, again, you, you want, you'd love to have a games management team. Um, you don't want to fill positions for the sake of filling positions, right? Um, so what you want to do is as you're, you're kind of vetting those people that are going to come in um, and be a part of your management team, find out what their skills are and play to their strengths. Again, you guys will have more success if you're playing to people's strengths and they're having a good time because those are their strengths. Um, couple do nots as well. Again, do not use up all your assistant coaches on GMT roles. Um, you want to have your coaches coaching. That's, that's one of the things that I've seen in the past that those are the people that are most available. They're the people you're most comfortable with. So they're the first people that you tap into, but you got to remember that your team needs to do the typical team stuff along the way as well. Um, don't forget to, to ask your GMT members what their needs are. Um, don't assume you know everything they need to do their job. Again, those lead up meetings, hey, um, we're, we're looking at opening ceremonies. What do we need for opening ceremonies that we don't have? What are you thinking about? Um, hey, we, we have staging, uh, we have the chairs prepared. Is there something that we're not thinking about in staging that you need? Um, and then on top of that too, again, finding out the, the strengths and the needs of your, your folks. Um, you know, just to throw one out there, if, if you have somebody on your games management team, um, that's, a, that's a diabetic and, and they need, you know, uh, to take insulin or, or have to keep their blood sugar up and that kind of stuff throughout the day. Make sure, one, you know about that so you can keep an eye on them. I'm the first person, you know, Steve will tell you right out the gate, I'm terrible about eating and drinking and all those things at events. So people need reminders and then you'll know. And then on top of that, too, you can potentially have somebody to, to sub in for them when they need a break or something like that. Um, and then one of the biggest things to not do too is, and when it comes to your GMT is to let them know this is a competition. This is an event. This is not just a special practice. This is not just a, an extended practice. We are here to, to run an event and to create an atmosphere of a competitive environment for our athletes and coaches and unified partners and everyone to get that competitive experience. Um, you know, again, you don't want to just blow it off and say, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a special practice. We're going to do a couple extra things. No need to worry about stuff. Um, you want to take it as serious as you want your athletes and unified partners and coaches to take it. Um, because again, it's preparing them to advance to higher levels of competition that they will need to take seriously. Registration, um, registration basics. You guys have gone through registration for a lot of the stuff that we do. You've probably gone through registration for stuff that you guys do as a program internally. You've probably done it for other programs as well. So you've seen there's different ways to do it. There's no perfect way to do it, but these are just some suggestions that we have um, for you as we move along here. Um, so some things to consider for, for registration as you're setting that up and making the ask of other programs or even your program um, to register for your event. Um, again, how many participants can you invite? What's the capacity? And, and factors of that may be um, individuals, you know, how many teams you could take relays depending on events offered and stuff like that. Um, it's also going to depend on your, your facility. We've talked about it with Loyola. Loyola has a certain capacity so we can get everybody into the pool and create a good experience. We have a cap for how many people we can take. Um, one note that when we we do look at how many people we can take. Um, unified partners do not count towards a team's allotment. Um, they do, you do have to think about them in a space capacity of 
when they're waiting for events, those are going to be more people that you have to facilitate and have in the building. Um, but they don't necessarily count towards the team's allotment. Does anybody know why that is? Does any of our, our, our swimming folks that have been to a bunch of qualifiers, um, and you guys may have even read it or heard me say it at some point as well, too, of why unified partners do not count towards allotment. If I don't see a, a hand raised, I, I'll, I'll give you this one so we can keep moving along here. Unified partners don't count towards allotment because there are already there are already athletes that are being accounted for in the pool during those relays, right? So it's not something that you have to double count. They're not going to be in their own race in their own heat that's going to take up time and space in the pool. They're just technically part of a race and heat and time that's going to be in the pool that's already accounted for for athletes as part of the allotment. Um, so again, technically you do not need to factor them in as part of the allotment but you do need to factor them in when you're thinking about space for housing people and getting them all in the building safely. Um, one major thing that we always ask for for registration when it comes to um, loyal and summer, summer games is in the notes, um, we ask people to put, you know, special needs for participants. Um, my athlete needs to be in, in the first lane because of ambulatory issues to get in and out. My athlete needs uh, to use the lift because they have difficult time getting into the pool. Um, I have an athlete that is, is swimming this stroke, but because of this uh, physical disability, they have a stroke issue or limitation. Those are things that you'd love to capture um, leading up to the event, not only so you know for when you set up divisions in the pool and all those kind of things, but a big important note that I put after that is make sure that that gets the staging in the pool deck um, and gets your officials as part of the pool deck as well. If there's a stroke issue because of a, a physical adaptation, um, you know, somebody like Rob Daubry has been around a long time. He may catch that without the note, but if he has that list of notes based on this athlete in this heat has this, you know, uh, request as a special need, then, then him and his team will be on top of it. Um, for staging, a really important one is pool entry. If the list needs to happen, if staging has that, staging can make that call to whomever may need to operate the list five heats before they get in there. You know, it, it, it'll allow the flow of your event to be more efficient and people aren't being surprised by those requests. Um, and then you can also facilitate those requests for, for your team or other teams that may come along. Um, something else to think of, again, medical condition needs. Um, you may have an athlete that, that can't walk the distance because of seizures or something like that. That's good to know um, to put in there, um, you know, re relay team details, right? So we always try to ask for the relay teams uh, of the team members in swim order. Um, so when you write out your team of Anne Arundel County dash name one, name two, name three, name four, um, that helps not only for us knowing that the names are in the run order if something gets printed out funny, um, but it, it just makes things a lot quicker for, for everybody overall, quite honestly. Um, and then one thing that we always recommend too is collecting contact info from programs um, and slash coaches or, or lead whoever that may be. Um, so during the competition, if there's something that happens during the competition, you can reach out and let them know. If there's something that happens prior to the competition, you can reach out and let them know. If you want to reach out after the competition and thank them or send them results, you have that information to let them know, but it's always good to get whomever may be coming for your competition, get their contact information so you can touch base with them. Um, team and program registration kind of continued here, um, collecting that registration information, right? Um, so when it comes to collecting registration information, we uh, tend to use GMS. Um, the games management system has been around for forever now, it feels like. Um, and it's, it's a great tool. It collects the information. It collects qualifying scores. And the really helpful thing for us with ga the games management system is that it allows us to division and do that kind of stuff. Um, directly in it. That's not to say that that is the best way. It's not to say it's the only way. Um, there are a bunch of different ways. There are plenty of people that use Excel spreadsheets. Um, I'm pretty good with Excel spreadsheets, but there are times that I want to throw my computer um, when Excel doesn't do what I want. So um, Excel is not the, the route for me to go. Um, uh, Meet Manager is something that can be used that can be plugged directly into Dactronic systems. 
Um, you know, those are all viable options. And there may be another option out there that works best for you. But again, you want a centralized point where you can collect all the entry information that folks send in um, and put it into one place for yourself. Um, if you're collecting everything via spreadsheets, maybe you just use an Excel spreadsheet to, to house everything as well and just merge it that way. Um, you know, you want to think about, like I just said, how, how's that information going to be collected? Um, for games management system for GMS, um, you guys typically have somebody that goes in and, and plugs in all the names, plugs in all the information and data um, and handles that. Um, like I said, you can use an Excel spreadsheet that you make up and have everybody fill out with the names, um, gender, age, qualifying score, all that kind of stuff that they submit back to you. Um, I'm not sure if Meet Manager spits something out for a registration or if there's a direct registration like GMS. I haven't used Meet Manager before. Um, if you have any questions on that, I know Neil has used it in the past, um, but that's something that can be used. Um, a Word document, there's plenty of ways to go. Um, ideally, you may not want somebody sending you an email or a text message with names and, and ages and qualifying scores all over. Um, unless you have, unless in the email that you send them to get stuff, you set up a specific way to have it sent back via email, that is possible. Uh, but again, just thinking about how is that information going to be collected? One of the biggest things too is who is the information sent to for all the data collection? So when that information comes in, who's taking that information and putting it into your centralized point? Um, is there is there a, a GMS knowledgeable person that's handling it if you're using GMS? Is there somebody that just is really good with Excel spreadsheets that's going to handle it for you? Um, is it is it your person that's your in charge of timing for your GMT? Um, so that's something that you got to figure out. Um, and then as you craft your email and you're, you're working on your communication of, of your event and how you want things back, um, who is sending that back to you? When you email, you may send an email, like we traditionally send an email for swimming stuff and we request information. We'll send it to um, area directors, area director support, head coach, um, and then anybody that we had as a, a, a registered assistant coach um, of the prior year. But you don't necessarily want everyone on that list sending you bits and pieces back. So you may want to designate, hey, we only want your um, area director, um, sports coordinator, and or head coach sending this information back. Um, again, just getting the information in your communication um, and giving enough that people will know exactly how you want it back so it comes back the way you want it so that you can put it into your centralized point a lot easier. Um, and then, again, it kind of folds back into who is the information uh, sent to for data collection. Who's handling entering that information into GMS, Excel spreadsheets, Meet Manager? Um, and then on top of that, who's going to be the person to double check? Um, luckily, when stuff comes in, uh, you know, I'll do a check of it. I'll send stuff back out to you guys for the state level. You know, Steve will double check it. We have, we have uh, a handful of people that are, are able to do those things. Um, but, you know, figure out who is part of your GMT or part of your team that's going to enter that stuff, that's going to check the information as it comes in, um, and who's going to be responsible for double-checking it. Because when that information comes in, it's a lot of names, it's a lot of numbers. It's great to have a second set of eyes on it. Um, and then for a registration deadline, we typically like to throw out there two weeks out from your event, ideally. Um, two weeks out kind of gives you time for the process of, you know, a couple days after the registration to turn stuff back around, say, this is what you sent me, double check to make that this is, make sure that this is correct. Um, any corrections can be then made. And then from there, once you have everything set up and ready to go, um, that gives you a chance to send out, hey, we now have it set up. Here's the heats and stuff. This is our game plan. Double check this one last time. Double check your roster. These are the people that we're approving the coming that you sent us. Um, and then it also gives you time to print out heat sheets or whatever you may want to print out and have that stuff ready, get your equipment ready, know how many people are coming, um, you know, finalize lunches if you're doing lunches and all that stuff. Two weeks is kind of the, the sweet spot where it's not too far out um, and it's not too close to the event that you don't have time to double check things. Um, again, that's a recommendation. We don't say that it has to be two weeks out. Um, from our experience in the past, that's what's worked um, the best for us at least. Hey, Zach, this is Mike. Um, just yeah. to note also one other point, and I apologize if you said this when I had stepped away for a moment. Um, 
uh, certainly can use any of those. Heck, you can go back to the old days of using file cards. But um, one big advantage that GMS has is, uh, and particularly for sports like swimming and track and field, probably they're the biggest ones that where this advantage is there, is that you can take, you, you basically only have to enter, uh, the coach only has to have the, uh, the entry done once for all the competitions during the season because uh, after their first meet, the results get keyed in, those individuals can get advanced, basically copied with their score into the next competition. So um, uh, to the extent that that's an option and, and we'll, we'll do additional training in GMS and such, but to the extent that that's an option, it actually does ultimately make life easier for folks uh, unless you happen to be the first event of the year. <laughs> Doesn't help that one, but it helps everybody else uh, going forward. So just something to consider if you have that opportunity. Thanks, Mike. Um, and if you have GMS questions, Mike's very well versed in GMS. So um, I'm sure he would love to answer any uh, GMS questions you may have as well. Um, I'm not too bad myself. I can help with that. Um, I don't know about asking Steve. He, he's pretty good most of the time, but um, questionable for, for all GMS advice. Thank you um, for that. Moving, I, I, I got to get it in there somewhere, Steve. You know, I got to make a joke here and there to, to keep things light. Um, registration information needed. Um, again, what's, what's needed for registration? What are the key components that you need to ask for for, for registration? Um, athlete, coach, slash, unified partner names, of course. What program and delegation that they're from? What events they'll be swimming in? Um, what are their qualifying times? Um, alternates. Uh, and then, of course, the one thing every athlete and, and unified partner, coach, volunteer, whomever it may be coming to event, um, needs is the valid medical on file through the date of that event and volunteer paperwork. Again, that's for class A volunteers who work with your team, you know, week in, week out, day in, day out. Um, you also uh, may, one thing that helps for division purposes, which we'll, we'll talk about division down the line too, um, that we would recommend is also asking for, for age, for age groups and stuff. Um, that is part of the Article 1 divisioning criteria, um, but we'll talk about that down the line. But these are, these are the core components of what you should be asking for to put your event together um, paperwork-wise. Um, again, check for accuracy. Remember to double-check submitted registration for missing information and qualifying time mistakes. Um, you know, it's probably pretty rare that somebody swims a 25 meter, even a freestyle in one second. Um, there's probably some numbers and digits missing there. Um, so that's, those are the moments that you want to double check those things, follow up with folks and say, hey, you know, I, I'm sure Timothy's a, a very good swimmer, but I don't know if he swims this in one second. Um, so going back and double checking, um, the quicker you notice those things and can hop on that, the quicker you can fix those and move along with your registration. Um, Volunteer recruitment, um, a lot of this comes from directly from uh, Sam Boyd, who's our volunteer director. She passed along a lot of this information. This is a lot of part of her process. Um, and a lot of this stuff, I think you guys have a good grasp on and really know um, from recruiting general volunteers, even just for practice for each season and stuff like that. Um, so again, you want to consider what your overall volunteer needs are. Make a list of what areas need to be covered and how many volunteers need to be able to perform each function. You know, how many folks do we need as timers on the pool deck? How many people do we need at staging helping escort athletes into the pool deck? Um, you know, how many people do we need at awards to help facilitate awards? All those little things. Um, again, consider what your, your ideal number would be. Consider what the maximum that you can facilitate and have a good experience for those volunteers would be, as well as the absolute minimum uh, of what would be needed to function and operate ideally um, and, and in, a, in a pinch if that situation came up. Um, having assignments uh, for your volunteers prior to the morning of the event, um, you, it, it helps you, it probably helps them, but it's not the definitive way to go. Um, you can always adjust as needed. Um, and there's of course multiple ways to handle volunteers and assignments and stuff like that as well. Um, again, for recruiting volunteers, Flyers do really well. Um, it's just where you place them. If it's at the rec center, if it's at the local high schools, if it's at the facility where you're going to be, um, have a, a physical flyer to post. Those always work well still. Uh, and then 
most of you guys have um, social media of some sort for each of your um, area programs. Um, if not, a lot of you have personal uh, personal social media that you can post to. Have a digital format too to, to stick up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok. I, I don't know what all the other ones are. Um, Snapchat. Um, um, ha and then have a centralized point to register volunteers. Um, you guys know that the quickest thing and that you lose volunteers on, quickest thing that you guys potentially opt out on, quickest thing that I would opt out on, quite honestly, is if it's not easy and there's not one centralized point to, to sign up to volunteer, um, you're going to lose people, right? Um, maybe it's a, a Google document that you put the, the shared link to that they can go into and add their name and their contact information. Um, maybe it's a Google form where you give them the link and it pops up and says, hey, you know, give us your name, give us your, your contact information, um, what position would you like to do? Or maybe it's, it's using something like Volunteer Hub like we use. Um, there's a lot of different ways to go about this, just like uh, program uh, registration stuff. Whatever works best for you, um, is, is, that's totally fine, as long as it's a centralized point that volunteers can get to and register in an easy fashion, that's great. If you have questions or have had struggles or are struggling with registering volunteers in a centralized point, Sam's a great person to reach out to. You can reach out to me to connect you guys. You can reach out directly to Sam. Um, you all know that Sam doesn't bite. She loves to talk. Um, so she'll have a great conversation with you guys around um, registering volunteers if you have any questions. Um, again, vo volunteer recruitment, um, where, where can you recruit for volunteers? A lot of the things that we talked about recruiting at GMT, same thing, school groups, school swim teams, community centers, libraries, rec centers, uh, military and law enforcement groups, uh, civic and community groups like was mentioned before, Knights of Columbus is a great group, um, Sons of American Legion, local businesses. Um, when Steve was mentioning before, um, people that may donate, there may be a pizza shop in town that gives you 50 bucks a year just as a, a nice thank you. Hey, maybe they want to get involved. Maybe there's a weekend that they want to come out and, and see what it's all about. Um, and again, mentioned sports specific groups, groups, school swim teams, community swim teams, all sorts of things. Um, I'm going to pass on other groups that you might use, but I know you guys probably have plenty of groups that are out there. Um, I want to keep things moving along, and I know you guys are, are very versed in, uh, uh, well-versed in, in recruiting volunteers because you need them to run your programs in the first place. The difficult one for recruitment can be recruiting officials, right? Um, again, officials are always in high demand, so getting them can be a challenge. Um, recommendations on our end for securing them is, one, work with myself uh, or the sports management team for your sport um, to connect with their officials. Uh, you know, we, I, I've talked about Rob Daubry plenty of times. Rob is more than happy to reach out to his team of officials all across the state of Maryland, see what he can do, do to help. Um, Rob tends to work with the no northern half of the state, um, and Tim, that does our uh, timing system, works with the southern half of the state. So between two of them, um, they're more than happy to help you. The thing is, they need requests super early because their officials are also taking requests and they're slotting them in other non-Special Olympic meets as well. Um, so get those requests as soon as you get your event date planned. Um, our recommendation, if you're going to make a request and really, really want to secure those Rob Daubry or Tim officials, is request it in the fall. Um, you know, we talked about getting that, that facility date secured as soon as possible. If you have a, a competition in April and you secure it in May, and for some reason that you are able to, to lock that down, you know, let us, let us know that May and we'll, we'll put it out to, to Rob right away. We may need a reminder in the fall, which wouldn't hurt. Um, but again, if, if you work with a school and you lock down that facility as the school year starts, put that request out to us for swimming officials in the fall. I know you guys got a lot of other things going on, um, so that can be tough on your end as well. Um, but the sooner you make that request for officials, the more likely Rob and Tim and their teams will be able to accommodate and help you guys out. Um, additionally, any connections that you guys may have with local swim teams or clubs or schools teams, may be able to connect you with their resources. Um, when it comes to bringing in officials, you want to use national governing body uh, certified officials 
as much as you possibly can. Um, again, you want USA Swim certified officials as much as you can get them. Um, with that, I will say that you, you may have to be prepared to pay those officials. Um, not everybody is going to uh, offer up their time as a volunteer service, but to have good quality officials for your event, it's definitely worth the investment for sure. Um, again, so the first part that we kind of looked at is, is a lot of the, the very first parts of decision making, um, getting ready to, to decide to, to hold your event, where you're going to have the facility, how you're going to get people to register, how you're going to get volunteers on site. Um, a lot of the very basic pieces that you're looking forward to, um, to, to set out the, the foundation of having your, your competition and being ready to go. Um, part two here, it's still foundational pieces. It's still decisions that you have to make before the competition. Um, but it's, it's things that you're going to be doing as you progress more along through the planning stages than a lot of the, the initial stuff to, to make decisions on before you can even get moving. So, so the second part here, we'll talk about events offered, uh, equipment list, and divisioning. So here you'll see our, our 2020 uh, SOMD swimming order of events. Uh, you guys know that this is something that is always a, a process and a half every year um, to, to look at and, and reconsider how we offer events at summer games at least um, and how we plan to do things for, for the three-day period there. Um, again, last year, you know, just like if you're holding a first-time event, Last year for summer games, we added Friday. We we really took a look at how much time it took to run each type of event in 2018. Really pulled those kind of pieces together, you know, put the puzzle together and 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 took a shot at it. It worked out pretty good. Um, but there's things that we came back and, and tweaked this year. Um, the sports management team sat down and, and really worked through a lot of stuff. Um, you know, so figuring out what events uh, and the order that you're going to offer those events in is is really key, especially to competitions that involve sports like swimming, track and field, um, cycling, long distance running, anything that's multi-event oriented. There's a lot more that goes into what you're offering than um, uh, other sports, some of the team sports um, that have one or two things to consider there. Um, so yeah, what, what events are, are you going to offer, right? So the first thing that uh, I tend to, to think about, especially when it comes to um, area regional kind of competitions is what type of event are you offering um, and i will shout out howard county does a really nice job of this um, they offer they offer a long distance event and then they offer a standard you know everything up to i believe 200 meter event i could be wrong it might only be up to 100 meter but um but so what are you offering a long distance event we're only going to offer everything 200 meter plus um, we need to get uh, our athletes and we know other areas need to get their athletes through um, longer distance events and not everybody offers them. So we're going to offer that short distance events, your, your more sprint length swim uh, events. You know, we're going to offer the core events. You see this at, at Loyola. We really only offer the, the core 25 meter to hundred meter um, events. Um, and I will say one note for, for Loyola, you will notice that there, there are certain key, 25 to 50 meter events that we don't offer um, because of, of different circumstances, right? Um, and then there may be might be a situation where you know you're going to offer fundamentals events for for 15 to 25 meter. Like we've broken fundamentals for summer games into Friday. Um, we can give those athletes a little bit more attention. The pace is a little bit slower. There's less people in the gym. Um, that's something that you may just want to consider and think about. What type of event are you going to initially offer, right? Then on top of that, again, how many teams and participants are going to be involved? Um, that can be a major factor uh, in what events you offer based on how much time you may have to run the event. Um, uh, you're going to see that pop up quite a bit um, when it comes to events. So uh, I'm going to ask a really quick question here. When I, I kind of referenced it before, I actually almost gave away the answer, but I'm, I, I caught myself. Um, this is the Loyola 2020 order of events. So when you're looking at this really quick, um, what is missing that's found in the summer games order of events? I do not expect you to have the, the summer games um, order of events uh, memorized, but there's some really key ones that are pretty easy to pick out here. 
Um, and I am gonna, I'm, I was, I will let Miss Anna Eiler uh, unmute. And I think you need to, un there you go. I think you should be good. And it looks like we're missing the 1500 here. Yeah, so that's the big one right off the top, right? The 1500. And quite honestly, the reason we don't offer that at Loyola is because of how much time it takes to, to just run the 1500 by itself for, you know, a half dozen to a dozen athletes. And we have a, a very strict time re restriction when it comes to Loyola. We, we, need, we can be in there and start competition at 830. But we need everybody out the door, everything cleaned up by one o'clock. So essentially, we need to shut down competition by 1230 to get everybody out. Um, and do you, do you notice any other events that are missing that are actually pretty key events? Um, we're missing all of the 25 freestyle and belows. Yep. Yeah, so, so, tw so the, the two big ones um, that you don't see for, for 25 are free, and backstroke uh and quite honestly it's a time restriction thing again we only have so much time and we have so many athletes that enter the 25 free and the 25 back that if we offer that we'd never make our time limit um in addition to that anna noticed that we don't offer any of those friday fundamental events um essentially any of the friday fundamental events plus the 25 that i just talked about are not offered again just time restrictions and an amount of people that we can get in and out of the the building so um good job on that anna um again again exactly what we just talked about 25 free back 1500 meter fundamentals events and that has to do with time restrictions and you may run into that with your event um again we're talking about the thought behind it it's a time restriction situation you may have something with your facility that's a little different um and and that you may have to facilitate in a specific way like loyola uh to make that happen within your restriction um one question that I will throw out there um, as part of this, has anybody, has anybody run their own competition and run into any issues with the, the order of events in general? Um, ideas for your events that you, you've tried to offer these events, but for some reason it hasn't worked. Um, difficulties of uh, we did offer this and for some reason it, it threw us off or, or we didn't know how to facilitate it or we had trouble getting people in and out in a timely manner. Um, anything that's popped up with anybody's events that they wanna throw out there? If not, that's okay. Um, uh, we do, Zach? Yeah. This kid, yeah. Uh, hey. When we do the Naval Academy, instead of having mm -hmm. our athletes that do the long distances, like the 400, the 800, and the 1500 all in one day, we have three mm -hmm. timers, and they run them all first thing in the morning, and we time them at 400, time them at 800, and time them at 15. So they that, run that's, that's a real... That's a good example, Katie. We can thank Howard County for giving us that. Yeah, that, that's a really good example. Um, switching sports, we do something very similar with cycling. Um, it's really tough to get a full, you know, uh, 15, a full 10K, a full 5K. So what we do is we, we multi-event run them. So for anybody that runs the uh, uh, 10K and the 15K, We'll have everybody do the 10K, but anybody that's doing the 15K will keep going and do the 15K and we'll get times for both. Anybody that runs the, the, the five and the one will run together. You know, we kind of group them together like that. So that's a really good, efficient way to catch that if you want to offer that. Thanks for that, Katie. Quite all right. Um, I am going to unmute. Oh, no, I just lost her hand. There she is. I'm going to unmute Carol. Hey, Carol. I think you're muted on your end still. So. Oh, is, is that better? There you go. You're good now. Yeah, Katie got in before me. It, thanks to our county, that's how we did it with the the four, the eight, and the fifteen hundred uh, split times. But you can also do that with the two, four, and eight as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think for for the purpose of the, that approach is fine for a qualifier or a time trial to catch times um, and do right. things that way. If you're if you're doing a, a full competition where you're awarding, of course you need to run those full events that you're going to offer. So again, that's uh, something that you no, have to exactly. consider when you're deciding. Yeah. So perfect. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. 
Um, okay, then we will we will move forward. Um, again, if you have any thoughts or questions on events offered, um, you can feel free to type them into the chat. Um, we will have a Q and A at the end if something pops up. Um, but something really important too for when it comes to planning out your day along with your order of events and how that's going to play out is planning your schedule overall, right? Um, so along with planning those events that you're going to offer, you need to have that schedule laid out from the morning when the doors open till the last minute when everybody walks out the doors and you close them behind them. Um, so just some pieces to think about when you're doing your schedule is what time's your management team going to arrive? Uh, what time is volunteer check-in? Uh, what time are you going to have participants arrive? Um, you know, you kind of want to tear them off so they're not all arriving at the same time. Otherwise, there's a lot of bodies walking in the door at the same time. Um, a, a big factor, too, is what's your setup and teardown time? Um, you know, if your management team arrives at, at 7.30, 8 o'clock, you know, you may want to set your, your setup time for 6.45, um, you know, or, or 6.30, potentially, to get in there and get things set up, um, you know, key members of the management team being there, so on and so forth. And then, again, remembering what your teardown time is. When we talked about Loyola, um, we got to be out of there by, by one o'clock. So we have to cut competition and get everybody rolling out the door by 1230. So I can roll around and clean up the facility and, and our management team can clean up their stuff and get ready to turn over um, for the other people that are coming in at one o'clock. Um, breaks, you know, schedule your breaks in there for, for anybody that, that, you know, for lunch uh, or anything like that, or even just general breaks to, to give everybody a rest for a minute, you know, use the bathroom, catch up on, on what they're doing. Um, and then, then again, you want to have a, a good guesstimate of when awards is going to start. Um, you know, again, we tend to like to start with our longest event first. Um, I will tell you as part of planning our, our order of events and our schedule, it's always great to start with your longest event first because one, it gets people in the pool, it gets things going, but it gives you time to still get your feet under you if you still have some things to set up before everybody really mm -hmm. gets rolling. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity to, um, to potentially um, forecast your award start a little bit better. Because if that's going to be your first event and division that you're going to award, if it's the, the 800 meter, 1500 meter, you look at times that have been submitted last year, what their qualifying time is, and you can kind of crystal ball when that first award ceremony is going to be. Um, which also, if you do have uh, officers and law enforcement at that point, you can give them a better window, and they really like that and really appreciate that as well. Um, here's an example of the, the Friday schedule of how I schedule it on my end of it. Um, you guys have seen the summer games, you know, Friday. It starts at 8.30 in the morning, and, you know, uh, delegation check-in is 9 o'clock and so on and so forth. Um, but when it comes to, to the Friday schedule, uh, this is what it looks like on my end uh, with different things to, to kind of get to and work through. Um, the one thing that I will say on here is you're looking through, um, there is a section on laptop and printer setup for if we need to print medicals. Um, we always have that prepared and ready to go as a backup to uh, your coaches having medicals on them. Um, that's not necessarily something that you may have available or be able to do. Um, so that's not something I would directly uh, say that you would have to build into your process either. Communicating your schedule. Um, but one of the biggest things that, and one of the biggest things we always hear from you that you would like is, is the earlier you guys can get the schedule, the earlier you guys can plan your day and be prepared and ready to go. Um, so one thing is one, you always see us put tentative on the schedule. Um, you want to stick to your schedule as much as possible, but you never know what's going to happen. Um, I know I wasn't around, but I, I've heard the story uh, of swimming getting delayed because of lightning because they don't have a grounded pool at Towson, um, and that is not something that you can predict in your schedule, unfortunately. So, again, putting tentative on your schedule kind of builds in that leeway and lets people know, like, this is the game plan. If everything goes perfectly, this is what we're going to run. If something comes up, though, please be flexible with us. Um, again, try to get the schedule out uh, a week prior um, we, we like to say worst case scenario, uh, you know, the Wednesday or Thursday prior to the competition. Um, but, but my goal is always to try to get it out a week prior again to give whoever's attending that, that ability to look at the schedule, be prepared, tell their, their athletes, their families, and other um, 
keep people as part of their delegation when they need to be where, what to expect, and, and put that schedule in their hands as well. Um, again, use your coach's contact list to make sure everyone gets the information you're sending. Like we said, with registration, get that coach's contact list in so that you have that in your pocket ready to go so when you send stuff back out, you're getting everybody that you need to get. Um, another thing that we're going to hit is equipment and equipment lists. Um, they are super helpful for making sure you have everything, um, but, but what goes into putting together an equipment list and figuring out what you need? Um, step one, what, what equipment do you need? How, how do you kind of figure that out? Um, and also to take in consideration what, what's the budget for equipment or, or, you know, replacing equipment that you may need. Um, another question that you put out there is, where are those items located? Where, where do I find those things? Um, what are the stakeholders that need to be involved? Who do I need to contact? Who do I need to talk to? Um, how do you procure items that you don't have? Uh, if a purchase needs to occur, what's the approval process for that? Um, what's the source of the equipment? Where is it coming from? Uh, and then who's responsible for the equipment? Uh, might be multiple people. Uh, who's picking stuff up? Who's bringing what back to where, in what condition, so on and so forth. Um, those are all the questions that you want to talk about. Um, so before we before we ask what equipment that you need, right? Um, where are the items located? Um, a lot of the times, you know, you may have them in storage or something else. Um, you know, you may have to borrow them from a facility. You may have to borrow them from um, SOMD HQ. Um, th there's a couple different places that things could be located. Um, stakeholders who needs to be involved. You know, who on your games management team do you need to talk to about who needs what equipment? Um, area director, who do you need to reach out to say, hey, um, we're looking for this piece of equipment. Do we have this in storage somewhere? Can we borrow it from someone? Um, can we buy it if we need to? Um, and then to follow up with that, you know, who, who's part of that approval process of if you need to purchase uh, equipment that needs to be brought in? Um, that goes for rentals as well. If you need to rent chairs, tables, whatever it may be, who's, who's part of that approval process? A lot of the times it is your area director. Um, it may be a, a regional director if you're in one of those uh, areas that have a regional director. Um, so again, it's talking to your, your leadership um, within your program. Um, what's the source of the equipment? A lot of like, uh, where are the items located? Uh, where is it coming from? We talked about that stuff. Um, and who is responsible for the equipment? Uh, which games management team member is potentially picking up equipment from where? Um, you know, who's bringing in uh, equipment that they may already have at home and they say, hey, we have stopwatches. No need to, to worry about that. We'll bring them in. Um, so to transition from there, what, what equipment do you need for a swimming competition? Um, I am going to ask, um, let's see if I can unmute. Hey, Zach, while you're, while you're picking, while you're uh, deciding who you're going to pick on for this question, two things I'll add to that is um, very important. Again, we talked about having a facility manager on your games management team. A lot of times the facility has a lot of the equipment you may need. So um, share that equipment list once it's developed with the facility to see what they have that, that you can utilize. Um, secondly, what I would suggest, uh, highly recommend and highly suggest is that when you ask your management team what equipment they need to perform their functions, get very detailed lists as far as item descriptions, quantity, and also, you know, where could we source this? I say that because, you know, I'll give an example. At the Olympics, I asked, we were running the ice hockey venues, and I asked for the equipment list, and I got, I need pads of paper, I need pencils, I need paper clips. So I walked into the meeting, I said, here's your pad of paper, here's your two pencils, and here's your three paper clips. And the looks I got were, you're crazy. We need a hell of a lot more than that, excuse my language. But again, if they don't provide you the details, then, then, you, then you're going to fail them. So again, I can't stress it enough to get details on that equipment list request. Back to you, Zach. For sure, that's, that's definitely important. Um, and your story is a very good one to give a, a good picture of, of what you're talking about there. Um, Deborah, I think we may have you on the phone. Did, can you hear us and, and do we have you on the phone now? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. We have you. Do you, do you okay. have, what equipment would you typically want to bring? Um, tables and chairs so people can sit down mm -hmm. and, 
you know, use those pencils and papers and pads that you were saying. Um, For sure. Any anything else you can think of? Well, I guess you'd have to. You'd bring your own computers, I would think. Printers. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yep. Those are good to have. Um, kind of off the off the topic of maybe like jugs for water and to put water in. Yep. Uh, you see us at uh, competitions. We have a ton of those uh, orange Gatorade jugs that we bring around with us. Yeah. Those those are all really good answers. Uh, thanks for sharing with us there. Um, let's see. I'm going to ask one more person. Um, let me ask. I'll go back to, I'll, I'll bother Ruth again. Ruth, give me, give me a couple more things that we want to bring to a swimming competition. I'm from swimming. Well, it's the tough way. I mean, you've got <laughs> you know, little, little health bars, snack things in between that you can pass around to keep people, um, have, have some energy in between. Snacks are definitely good, um, for sure. Uh, anything else, Ruth, that you want to throw in there? No, I think we try, I think it's pretty well covered that I can think of. Okay, thanks for the ads. Um, so a few more things that we'll, we'll um, again, timing system a lot of times the facility has, um, but there has been situations, like I've mentioned, that, hey, we need to bring in a couple of the, the buttons uh, to, to help the plungers uh, to catch times. Um, any heat sheets, paperwork, one of the biggest things is how many copies. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, I struggle with how many copies all the time. And our games management team, we, we talk about this all the time. Um, we try to refrain from killing too many trees. We do a very good job of killing trees quite often. Um, so that's one thing that we've looked at to, to reduce paperwork of how much exactly do we need. Um, definitely want to bring stopwatches to, to catch backup times, even if you have a timing system. Uh, clipboards, you know, the, the, the pens and pencils and the pads to write on are great, but if you don't have something, if you have loose paper that you're doing heat sheets on or something, it's really tough to write without clipboards. Um, typically, you will not have to bring in lane lines. Um, the facilities will have them, but again, you never know conversation with the facility to check in with them. Um, chairs uh, for, for staging, for lanes, for just general sitting in the waiting area. Um, that's great to bring in. Um, awards, if you're doing awards, make sure you remember them. Um, I have had my fair share of uh, forgetting an award here or there, um, so you definitely want to make sure you don't forget them. Um, what I will show you is um, uh, I will send out after this as a follow-up, I will send a copy of our Loyola packing list so you can see a detailed example of what Steve's talking about um, when it comes to we need uh, pens and pencils. We want the quantity is two. We want boxes of pencils. We want them to be um, wooden pencils, not mechanical pencils, so on and so forth. Um, I will send that list after this um, training so that you can see a list that we use. Um, again, we talked about where are those items, right? Uh, make sure to note where each of your, your items is on that equipment list. Um, the Loyola list doesn't have that, quite honestly, on it because 95% of it is right in the SOMD office, so we just pull it out of storage. The Summer Games list, though, because it has multiple venues and things are coming from multiple places, we're, we're renting stuff left and right. That says who is bringing it and where it's coming from, um, just so we know, so there's not a panic at the last minute of um, who's, who's bringing all these chairs, were we supposed to bring them? No, Select is bringing them. Um, and then again, places that they may be, you may have some stuff at home. Area program storage, it may be in one centralized spot. Um, the facility may have it right in their storage. Um, another program may be bringing stuff. You know, uh, there's even times, um, you know, for, for sailing is a really good example. For, for sailing, the, the locally popular sport, um, the Flanagan's work with St. Mary's County, um, the Flanagan's bring a lot of the sailing specific stuff, but St. Mary's County, they bring in um, award stands, chairs, tables, and all that stuff. So they work with another program that's attending um, and helping facilitate to bring stuff in. And then, of course, SOMD HQ, um, you can always reach out and ask if we have something that you can borrow. Um, we, we may not always have what you're looking for. Um, there's a good chance we do. 
Um, but it also may be lent out somewhere else or we may be using it. So there's always a chance, but always ask. It, it never hurts to ask us for sure. Um, so who's involved with equipment, right? What other stakeholders need to be looking over the equipment list before the event? The facility manager, Steve, Steve mentioned that. Again, build that relationship with that facility. Say, hey, this is what's on our, our equipment list. What do you guys have on site that we can borrow so that's less stuff that we have to bring in and then that's less foreign objects that are coming into your building as well. Um, whoever's leading your, your competition, uh, your event director, your swimming director, whatever you may want to call them, um, your director of officials to let them know, you know, how many copies of certain heat sheets they may want printed, um, let them know that they have enough pencils and clipboards and stuff to access that stuff, um, having enough DQ sheets for them. Um, I know some of you have some jokes running with Rob Daubry about all those beautiful little yellow tickets he gives you guys, um, your volunteer director of, you know, paperwork that they may need, pens and pencils that they may need for sign-in. Uh, you know, one of the things that Sam likes to do is uh, name tag labels for, for volunteers to wear, uh, snacks for volunteers to have. Um, your logistics director, when we were talking about water jugs and, and the chairs and tables, how many of those things are coming in that they have to have their team ready to set up and mobilize. Um, and then again, if, if, you know, your sports director, myself, um, if you have a different sport with Melissa Anger or Ryan Kelchner, um, check in with your sports director, just say, hey, this is the game plan for our event. These are the pieces of equipment that we're expecting. Can you take a double check at this list to see um, if this is everything we need? All right. Um, so where to get equipment, right? Um, so you may be asking yourself, I'm missing these items. I need to, to make my competition successful. I don't have them. Where do I get them? Um, again, check with area leadership. It might be in storage somewhere. Um, you, you never know. Uh, things get buried. I know for our storage at times, we go back there and we, we get surprised by things that we have and we, we refine um, as we move things around. Um, check with area leadership if something can be purchased. Um, again, purchasing is kind of your, your you try to make that your last resort. Um, but if you need to be purchasing something, check with area leadership to get approval for that. Um, check with your sports director to see if you can borrow it for SOMDHQ. Um, and again, check with the facility. The facility may have everything that you need. They may have pieces that you need. Um, and why have to bring something when it could be right there for you? Divisioning. Uh, divisioning is the, the fun slash tricky one out of everything, right? Um, some of you have, may have done divisioning before. Um, a lot of you have probably experienced divisioning in some sort of competition format, being on the, the coaching end of it, being on the program end of it. Um, and again, so divisioning follows Special Olympics Maryland, for Special Olympics Maryland, follows Article 1. Um, it's on the, the Special Olympics website. The link is at the bottom here if you haven't seen Article 1. Um, it looks similar to the rule sets that they have out there, um, but it's, it's used to division athletes in a manner to create the best competition experience possible. Um, it's not a perfect science for divisioning. Um, there is some flexibility outside of Article 1 to make the, the best competition uh, experience possible. Um, we, we like to follow it as much as possible, but there are times and outlying factors that there needs to be tweaks here or there. Um, so divisioning is not a, a perfect, you do it one, two, three step and move on. Um, there's some different factors that can come into play as you go through divisioning. Okay, so keys of, of Article 1, uh, divisioning is based on, on the three areas, um, gender, age, ability. I, most of you guys have probably heard that before. Um, it comes from Article 1 if you're wondering where those three come from. Um, divisioning is ideal variance between the highest time submitted for a division uh, and the lowest time for a division is 15%. There's flexibility in that depending on, on your divisions. You always want to create a good competition experience. Um, there are times that we will flex up uh, a certain amount to get a division together to create a competition experience. Um, you see this a lot when you run into the extreme highs of your qualifying scores and the extreme lows of your qualifying scores. You, you want to stay away from having divisions of one, 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 you know, one, two, one, two, as much as possible. Um, so there'll be a little variance and flexibility on that 15% from time to time. Um, where, where to division? Um, 
GMS will calculate the difference for you as you start putting your divisions together. It's part of its programming, um, and it'll also notify you on your age groups and gender of each division as well. Um, and the one note for you guys to note here as well um, is that we will be trying to host more uh, how to division sessions via Zoom and stuff like that. Um, for, for experienced users that know how to use the basics of GMS but want to take that next step and learn more about divisioning, um, that's going to be a, a TBA situation. Um, but I know, I know Mike likes to do those uh, and potentially I can assist as, we, as he needs. Um, so if we can get the, some of those on the board, we will get that information out to you guys. Um, but outside of GMS, Excel can division as well. Um, if you know how to set it up, it can handle the math and the variance of divisions, uh, if you know how to do the right formulas. I'm not great with the formulas. I, I can add stuff on, on Excel, um, but there's, there's a way to do it on Excel. I know there's other programs that do it via Excel, um, so it's possible. Um, and, and there are other options out there. Again, we mentioned Meet Manager before. Um, it, may, it may be a little different because it's not set up directly for handling Special Olympics Article 1 uh, divisioning guidelines like GMS is, but I'm sure it's possible. Um, and if you guys come across any other places that you like to set up your events and division and stuff, let us know, because um, the more you guys can teach us as well, we're always open to learn those other possibilities as well to offer. If it's a good way to do it, it might be a good way for other programs to do it as well. Um, again, the dream would be to, to use GMS across the board. Uh, again, that system's built for Special Olympics divisioning and taking in registration, uh, but we're open to other options as well. Um, before we move on to the next part, are there any questions about divisioning that you wanna ask specifically um, that we can answer here? Um, I will definitely take divisioning questions. Steve, Mike, we will all answer anything division-wise because I know that can be confusing at times. Looking for hands. I don't see any hands raised currently. And I'm, I'm in the questions box. Yeah, I, I don't see anything in the questions box either. Um, if there aren't questions currently on divisioning, that's fine. Um, again, we will have a, a Q&A towards the end there. Um, and again, if you think of something tomorrow, the next day, whatever it may be, feel free to, to reach out to any of us via email too. Um, we're always open to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, uh, part three for the competition. Um, we were planning to take a break here, but we moved through that last section with a pretty good pace. Um, is anybody, does anybody really need a, a break that we wanna take it here? Um, if you need a break, and really need it, type it into the, uh, the chat box. If not, I think we're gonna keep going to move this along, because uh, I don't wanna keep you guys too, too long tonight. I'm not seeing yeah, any. Say, yep, I'd say go for it, Zach. I think we're in good shape here. So um, let me reintroduce. Part three is gonna be competition. We're talking day of competition. You guys have gotten everything sorted away, all your information's in, everything's divisioned, all your paperwork's done, your equipment list is ready to go. You guys are ready to go, and now it's the day of competition, and this is what you guys have been preparing for, right? So just some quick tips straight out of the gate for uh, morning of the event. Step one, eat something for breakfast. I, I will tell you, I am not good at doing this, but I always at least pack some sort of um, cliff bar or something to take with me. Um, a lot of times you guys will see me running around with like a, a banana or two in, in my bag, um, plenty of water and stuff. Get something in your body, get ready for the day, get ready to go. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the most important things to starting your event off successfully. Um, one, arrive early to the venue. Um, there have been things that pop up that, you know, you get there and doors and gates are locked that you weren't anticipating and now you need to make some calls and, and get in touch with people to get the facility open. Um, again, that, that's probably the biggest thing for arriving early, uh, but it also gives you a good start to, you know, if you have a, equipment to unload, it, it gives you a little bit of a head start there. So when people do start showing up, your management team starts showing up, um, you're already a, a step above and ready to go. Um, have the facility contact number available. Have that in your phone program, written on a note in your pocket, tattooed on your forehead, wherever you need it. 
Um, but just have it ready to go because, again, you never know when you need to reach out to the facility person. Again, if doors are locked in the morning, um, if you get there and it's been raining all night and the parking lot's flooded, what's plan B? Can we go to plan B, get a confirmation? Um, but definitely have your facility contact number available and ready to go. Um, in the morning, make sure you have people there to assist you uh, as you're part of your management team or somebody. Don't do it all alone. Um, you do not need to be Superman slash woman uh, and, and make sure everything happens and, and handle it and sh shoulder the burden alone. Um, have people there to help you in the morning so you get off to a good start as a team. Um, one thing that we like to talk about is sticking to your, your hit list or punch list. Um, we'll cover that in a little bit of detail, but when I showed you the Friday schedule from my end, that's essentially a put together uh, hit slash punch list. Uh, but again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, make sure to get directional signs out early. Um, I try to do this as much as possible when arriving to an event because the better your signage is straight out the gate in the morning, the easier people get to where they need to get and the easier things get rolling. People aren't running late because they couldn't find out where the, the facility was, where the parking was, so on and so forth. Um, always get your paperwork organized for quick access. Have a table laid out somewhere that's just your paperwork table. So when your officials say, hey, I need another copy of the heat sheets, bam, I got you right here, Rob. Um, hey, uh, you know, we need a copy of the, the opening ceremony script. Oh, that's right here in the binder. Here you go. Um, get that stuff laid out early and easy to get to for whoever may need it. Um, and convene with your team as soon as the setup is complete. Um, it's one of those things where it's good to make sure everybody's on the same page, make sure everybody's ready to go for the day. But it's also good to have that moment with your team, like the day is here, this is what we've prepared for. You guys have done an awesome job. You guys are ready. You guys have the information. You guys have the tools that you need. And today is going to be an awesome day. You know, it, it's a good chance to convene with your team and give them appreciation for everything that they've done to get to this point and that they're going to have a great day from there on out. So I'm going to propose a real quick question here. Um, based on what you saw from that, that Friday schedule slash our hit punch list, can somebody give me a guess at what a hit punch list is? Let's see here. Who am I going to call on? I am going to call on, I'm going to call on Josie again. Josie, do you have a guess at what our, our, uh, a hit slash punch list is? Um, I'm just going to say a list of maybe like people or volunteers that you can count on to help you. Like if you run into a problem or something, I'm not sure. That's just my guess. No, that's, that's a good guess. That's a good guess. That, that's part of it. Um, but it's, uh, we'll give you the, the definition on this one here. Um, so your hit or punch list essentially is, um, it's your morning priority checklist, right? And, and that can involve what people need to do what um, and who can help you with what. Um, but it's, it's essentially a to-do list, but it's your, your main priorities that need to be accomplished in the morning. Um, this, this is definitely good for any event, but where I find it most helpful, quite honestly, is when we have multiple day events, um, you, you guys may see us every now and then at, you know, summer games, fall games, winter games, whatever it may be. You may see um, me, Melissa, Ryan, Steve sitting down in the lobby of a hotel talking and stuff and writing notes and stuff like that. Most of the time, that's us putting together our, our punch list or hit list for the next day of, you know, we have everything set up, but, oh, this needs to happen for day two because now um, instead of just the fundamental events, we have more athletes coming in, so we need to, to add this signage and so on and so forth. Um, but again, it's just your main checklist, your to-do list for the day. Um, that you, those are the things that you need to hit right away in the morning and potentially who you want to assign to them. Um, a note for you guys, when it comes to your hit list, the hit list, while it may be held in possession of by the, the games director or competition director or whomever may be in charge of it, it is not the to-do list of that single person to do. It is the game directors or the competition directors job to delegate those things though, to ensure those things happen in a timely manner. If there's things that need to happen in staging, uh, chairs need, extra chairs need to be set up, uh, you know, the game director doesn't have to do that. Your, your staging team can do that, you know. Um, if, if you wanna make sure that the, the timing system's running correctly and give it a test before it goes, game director doesn't have to do that. Have your timing people do that, have them handle that. Um, so again, 
great resource, but it's not just for the games director to, to do all of it. Um, again, you don't need to be Superman, Superwoman. You have a team, rely on that team. Um, volunteer training and management. Um, day of, Let me go back. Day of, yeah, hey, Zach, I just, just, want to hit, just want to hit something there on your to-do list or your punch hit list is, you know, you heard Zach continues to say it's not the games director's job to do everything. But again, when you're looking at that for a single day event, it's really important when you go back to when you were creating your schedule is when you want volunteers to arrive. Um, if you have the volunteers arrive early enough, uh, we typically do about an hour prior to the athlete arrival so that the, uh, the volunteers can get, get their assignments, get their name tag, check in, and then help set up. Uh, because if you have a lot of tables and chairs and all that to set up and you only have, you know, three or four management team people there, it could take take a while. And then everything else lags, lags, lags behind throughout the day. So, again, really, really look at when you want volunteers to arrive and what the purpose is, because they can help set a lot of things up for you. And you're just actually finger pointing and saying those need to go there. Those need to go there. Set that up over here. So just take that in consideration. Back to you, Zach. Cool. Great tip, Steve. Um, again, never hurts to have additional hands ready on deck to assist. Um, volunteer check-in. Uh, volunteer check-in can be a little chaotic. I know you guys have all experienced it in, in a variety of different ways. Um, but again, it's, it's set up a centralized check-in point and communicate that to your volunteers. Um, that's, again, when it comes to getting volunteers engaged and ready to go for the day, one of the biggest things is just having things communicated and easy for them to access again. So, you know, making sure they know where to check in because if, if they start wandering around and can't find out where to check in, you're going to lose them. Um, again, be sure to communicate what time the volunteers need to arrive and check in. Um, you know, it never hurts to say that we need our volunteers by eight o'clock. So we're going to tell them that they need to be here by 745. Um, it never hurts to, to hedge your timing bet there a little bit. Um, and then have the following things ready. Um, a list of registered volunteers for checking off who pre-registered and said they were going to show up. That always helps. Um, extra Class B registration forms for unregistered day of volunteers. Um, uh, for our system that we use through Volunteer Hub, if somebody goes on there and registers for an event, it takes them through the Class B registration process. But if there's somebody that says that, that finds out the event, it's going to happen through a, a, a word of mouth from somebody and they decide to show up and they didn't do that. We need those for, for legal and liability purposes to have those class B forms handled. Um, and again, there's a difference between class A and class B volunteers. Class A volunteers are typically your program volunteers that come in from a week to week basis that help you with practices and stuff like that. They may be area uh, leadership and people that assist with, um, different parts of area uh, sports coordinators and stuff like that. Uh, but it's those people that are day-to-day -day almost more with Special Olympics than, than a single day of event. Those are your Class A folks. They do not need to do a Class B volunteer day of if all their Class A stuff is current and up-to-date in our system. Um, but Class B is anybody that's showing up for the day of um, and additionally factoring in um, and Steve and Mike, you can chime in if, if I get the age wrong, but I believe it's 16 or older uh, that doesn't need a parent signature, correct? Uh, no, uh, uh, it requires a parent signature regardless. 16 and older doesn't require uh, a parent or guardian there <laughs> with them for the, for the uh, volunteer uh, um, experience. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the reminder. I, I knew there was a 16 above uh, tagline there somewhere. Um, other things to have ready for the day, um, name tags. Like I said, Sam really loves her name tags, and it's really good uh, to have. And it also helps that when those volunteers then meet who they're working under at staging uh, or on the pool deck or whatever, they can use names instead of kind of doing the good old, hey, you. Um, you can actually say, hey, Jess, can you come help me with this? Um, lunch tickets or vouchers for meals if they're provided for the day for volunteers. Um, and it never hurts to have uh, a couple copies of volunteer role position descriptions. Um, just to remind volunteers of like, hey, this is what you signed up. This is what we're having you doing today. 
here's the position description of what's going to happen today. There may be some extra things here or there, but here's the baseline of what it is. Um, if, if you need volunteer roles and position descriptions, that's something that we're actually working on and have uh, for a good amount of our events as well. Um, so if you need a description for a position, we may have it already. So feel free to reach out on that one. Um, one thing to also note about volunteer check-in and volunteer management um, that isn't on the slide that, that sometimes just pops up at events because you're not really thinking about it. Um, is have a designated person or persons that at least know that are part of it, that if you have people that need to have volunteer hours signed off on, have somebody designated. Um, there's a lot of times that, that you hit an event um, and you're going along throughout the day and somebody says, hey, um, I need a volunteer paperwork signed before I leave for my school. Yeah, sure, I can sign that. And then, then the day goes on and then they can't find you. And you, you want to make sure that if they need hours signed off on that, that they get those hours signed off on because, you know, they're doing us a huge favor by coming in and volunteering. Um, we kind of mentioned about assignments prior um, in one of the earlier slides. There's two ways that Sam talks about going about it um, and how she'll do it for different events. So random assignment, which, which is essentially pre-assignment where um, either A, when the volunteer registers, they say, hey, my skill set is this, I can do this. Um, then you can put them into, oh, they'll be a good timer. You know, they're, they're a swimmer. They have a background as a swimmer. They'll be good on the pool deck. Um, that's random assignment, pre-assignment. Uh, and then you can also work volunteer choosing the day of. Uh, you know, a, a, a family of four walks in um, and you, you check them in and everything and you say, hey, what, what are you interested in doing? You know, my recommendation potentially for a family of four or whatever would be that you guys help out with helping athletes um, as escorts from the pool, uh, from staging to the pool deck to award. Um, volunteer choosing can be a little, I'll say risky at times because if they take a while to choose and then you're explaining positions and trying to figure that stuff out, um, you know, it can be a little time consuming and kind of put you a little behind, uh, but it's, it's not a wrong way to do volunteer assignments. Um, again, having that planned out of your maximum minimum needs for each volunteer role, um, like we talked about when you're planning your event and the facility and getting things put together, that's good to have. Um, and then another really good thing to have that, that Sam likes to use is a list of what positions take priority to, to making the day happen, to getting things going. Um, you know, while you'd love a full stable of escorts at staging the athletes around the pool deck, you know, if, if for some reason you're running a little short on volunteers, you need people that are, are timers that are ready to go. Um, and so, you know, maybe maybe staging loses one or two people um, that they would have liked to have. Or, or uh, awards has extra hands because that's what people signed up for, but you need more people at staging, you know, and reassigning volunteers. Again, just have a list potentially ready to go um, for what the priorities are. And Josie has a question. Ooh, let me open your line. What's up, Josie? Hi, so I was just wondering for the 16 and older thing. So if the volunteer is younger than 16, their parent has to be there or they just have to get a parent signature? Mike, do you want to give a clarification on that one for sure? Sure, if they're younger than 16, it doesn't have to be their parent that's there, uh, but they do need to be, like so they would need to be there as part of a group. And so there's someone who is essentially supervising them uh, in their volunteer role. Um, uh, so that if they're there as part of a, I don't know, a school group or a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout group or, or a club or something like that, the person who is running that, that club uh, would, get, would be in that capacity. Um, when they're 16 and above, they can be there uh, independently without that, but still, it, basically until they're an adult, until they turn 18, they need that parent signature. Um, to for any kind of release and such. Does that, okay. that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Perfect. All right. Um, so moving along here, um, some, some continuation here of volunteer assignments. Um, Pre-assignment or day of assignments both go well when getting input, um, knowing their, their background and skills. Again, if you set up a form of some sort for them to register, you can always put in there, hey, do you have experience working with swim programs? And if they say yes, you can always put, 
how many years or whatever, or, or tell us a little bit about your experience with programs. So then if either you don't have them pick their own assignment and you pick their assignment, then you have an idea of what their skill set is to fit them into a, a position that one fits their skill set and helps you out the most, but they'll also have a good time doing because they know what they're doing. Um, again, try to keep groups of families together, uh, families for sure, especially if, if families are volunteering with, with younger volunteers, um, it's always much easier to have a, a parent ready to go. Um, and then for, for groups, again, it's, it's tough sometimes to keep groups fully together based on numbers and needs. Um, but if you can keep them in the same proximity, um, one, they tend to have a, a better experience as a group. And a lot of the times they're coming out as a group to have that group experience. Um, and two, they'll communicate a little bit better because they know one another. You know, there won't be as much shyness or um, worry about communicating with somebody that they don't know. Um, and then additionally, be clear to volunteers once assigned where uh, and when they are to meet their management team lead for training. Um, you know, one thing that we always definitely try to, to introduce is um, when somebody takes the volunteers in, they may check them in and kind of give them a, a minor orientation for the day, um, but they're not going to do the specific training on, let's say, timing. Uh, but they will then say that, hey, all my timers, right now it's, it's 7.45. At 8.05, you guys need to be on the pool deck uh, closest to the, the start line and where the blocks are. And your uh, training will happen with Tim at 8.05. Make sure you're there at 8.05, or you should probably go there right now because it's only 15 minutes away. Um, again, be very clear about that, letting them know where to go and when to be there to meet their team uh, management team lead for training. And then on the flip side, make sure you communicate to that management team lead that they need to be in the same place at the same time because um, it's, it's not good when you have management team leads ready to train volunteers and volunteers ready to be trained in two different places or at two different times. Um, again, volunteer training. Uh, your coordinator should be the person handling the check-in process and giving that basic orientation, um, but your leads for each part of the venue, award staging competition, so on and so forth, um, should do the job-specific training because they're the ones running that portion of the, the event, and they know how they want things done and the expectation of how to do that job. Um, again, I can't stress enough, make sure that you have set times and locations for that volunteer training for both the volunteers and the person training them. Another thing that, to consider when it comes to the day of competition is monitoring competition schedule and flow. Um, you've put your schedule out there, you have an idea, of what you need to, to stay on time for the schedule to get through your day. Um, every competition has, has that feel of, of timing and things being on, on pace, the flow feels good to run smoothly. Um, regardless of the sport, again, you need to kind of keep an eye on time um, and flow. Whoever your event director typically um, will be checking on that to, to make sure you're on schedule um, for what was published and to make sure you're getting through the day based on time constraints. Um, if you seem to get behind, check with the various functions of the event, um, the different parts, staging, competition area, awards, um, to see how they're feeling and if you can assist in any way to, to speed up the process. Um, and then there may be, as the event director or competition director, you may need to step in and, or whoever that may be, may need to step in and say, hey, look, we're, we're running a little bit behind. I see it's a little slow over here. Is there anything that I can do to help you? Okay, if you think you have it under control, Again, we need to keep things moving. Um, you know, I'll check back in in 10, 15 minutes to make sure we're good. Um, if you guys ever see, see Neil at summer games running around, he's always keeping notes too. Neil keeps like pretty precise notes on like how long a, a, a heat took to get to the pool, to get in the pool, to, to get through their event, and then checking how long that event overall took. Um, and he took, takes very specific notes on all that stuff, um, which is actually going to be something that we, we were looking into implementing for, for flow uh, and improving staging this year for summer games, but that's only because we had somebody checking on and monitoring competition flow and schedule throughout the day. Um, again, prepare an estimated uh, competition timeline for the event director to monitor um, to keep the event on schedule. Again, if you take the time and sit down you can look event by event and say, okay, this event, we have this many athletes participating in it. 
Um, the, the average time over all these athletes is a minute and a half. So, you know, if it takes a minute and a half for every heat, let's say, uh, give or take uh, 30 seconds for fastest and slowest, um, and we have this many heats, you can kind of do the math to, to build yourself a little bit of a, a timeline and schedule event by event um, and how much time that should take. It does take a little bit extra effort to put that together, um, but I would recommend potentially looking into doing that. Um, it's something that... Um, if you need assistance or questions on how to do that, I will actually refer you to Neil because, again, Neil loves all that kind of stuff. Um, and he does a fantastic job of keeping tabs on all that stuff um, for bo both Loyola and Summer Games. Um, again, use those registration timelines to determine how long each event potentially will take based on numbers of athletes in events and the average time of, uh, it takes to swim that event in that case. Um, again, assign target times to hit for each individual event. Um, if you have target times, it gives you something to aim for and shoot for, um, and it will keep you more on track for sure. All right, I'm actually going to turn it over to Mr. Steve Bennett here because uh, this slide has one of his favorite analogies for competition that he will talk you through, and he'll take the slides from here. All right, thank you, Zach, and I appreciate you. I think uh, give your give your voice a rest here for a minute, and I appreciate you powering through everything. Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the things you know you're always going to have things come up as we've talked about throughout the the webinar tonight. Um, but how do you manage those issues if it doesn't go exactly as you projected, or there's issues that come up throughout the day? Um, as a leader, everyone looks to you and your demeanor. Um, whether it's your management team, it's the coaches, it's the spectators, it's the athletes, or whatever, um, they look to you to see how you react to different situations. So as Zach was saying, one of my favorite analogies is, what do you see when a duck's on the water? Um, you see the calm, smooth, just flowing, just staying afloat, and just smooth sailing. What's going underneath the water is that duck is paddling and going crazy. So uh, the analogy there is you as a leader should be the duck on the water and what people see is your calm demeanor and how you react to different situations. Um, so, you know, when you look at this, always bring in your management team if they're major situations, if you have to delay or postpone um, an event uh, based on a situation, whether it's lightning, whether it's a flood in the restrooms that's spilling over or there's, you know, whatever it may be, or if there's a heated discussion with a parent or a coach, bring in those key members of your management team, go off to the side, um, if at all possible. And again, just be in a calm demeanor that will deflate the situation a little bit. And again, keep, uh, keep calmness um, throughout, the, throughout the event. <clears throat> so take care of your people. Obviously you have a lot of volunteers, you have your management team that you've recruited. Um, as Zach said, you know, always go around um, as a leader. It's, hey, when's the last time you had something to eat? When's the last time you had a, a drink of water? Um, do you need a, 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 break, uh, a break to go to the restroom? Um, you know, are you tired? Are your legs doing okay? You know, depending on uh, younger volunteers or, or older uh, demographics, um, check on them for their health and well being. And um, when you see someone getting a little flustered, um, when you're walking around checking on people, say, hey, let, let's take two minutes real quick. Tell me what's going on. And again, as we talked about earlier, what can I do to help? Um, if we need to take a five-second break, let's do that. Let's talk it over. Let's get back on track. But again, um, that, will, that will let the management team and volunteers know that you're there to support them and the, that everyone has each other's back. And we're in this together to make things go well for the participants and the spectators and coaches. Um, that's the number one job of the management team is to make a good event experience for everyone that's involved um, from general volunteers to the participants and spectators, et cetera. One of the things we always do, and, and we've been very successful, I think uh, some of you who run events as well, um, is making sure we continue to have that fantastic relationship with our host venues. Um, you know, it, it's, it may be a very simple thing, but as you walk around with your logistics people or with the volunteers, we say, hey, as you're walking around, if you see something on the ground, an empty bag of chips or an empty uh, snack bar wrapper, pick it up, put it in the trash receptacle. 
And, you know, it, one of the things it does is it keeps that venue clean throughout the day. But more importantly, at the end of the venue or at the end of the competition or the event is you have your team, whether it's your logistics crew or before you release the general volunteers who came for the day, say, hey, before, before you leave, we're going to do one quick venue sweep and make sure we leave this facility in great condition. I always try to, to keep or to leave the venue in at least the condition I found it, if not better than I found it. Um, whether it's out in the parking lot, in the restrooms, whatever, even if they have janitorial services, when they look at you as management team and leaders and you are in there cleaning up and helping with that, uh, two things that that does. It lets them know you respect their venue and also it wants, it, it lets them know that, hey, this is a good group and it gives Special Olympics good names so that when you ask the, hey, can we do this again next year? They're going to say, oh, heck yeah. I will say in my experience here at Special Mix Maryland, that word of mouth also flows throughout the, the community. So I've actually gone to different venues when we're looking for a new facility to host something, whether it's park and rec, high schools, whatever it may be. They say, oh, Special Olympics, yeah, hey, I know you guys did at uh, Loyola. Hey, they had nothing but great things to say about you. Sure, I'd be willing to, to bring you into our facility. So don't underestimate um, that. Again, even if they have janitorial crews and they say, no, 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 we got this, just walk around and do a quick little sweep and then say, hey, are you good? I think we got everything. It really just shows that mutual respect. Um, <clears throat> and again, like we said, the facility um, is, is very appreciative of that. Um, one of the things uh, we talked about, you know, the coaches have medical forms. Um, you guys have your um, check-in sheets. You have your punch lists, everything like that. The other thing we want to make sure you guys have is an incident form, um, incident report form. And we have copies of that. The area directors uh, for each program should have those as well. But um, what that is, is that's to track for insurance purposes um, and follow-ups any injuries that occur uh, to individuals, whether it's a participating athlete, a volunteer, um, a facility member, whatever, um, that the medical person will, personnel that you've recruited will um, get that form. Um, if, if you don't have medical bags or they bring their own, give them a couple uh, copies of that form to carry with them. And they'll, they'll uh, collect the information, fill out the form correctly. And then if there's any follow-up needed, um, we can do that after, if it's emergency transport that needs, someone needs to go to the hospital, we can do some follow-up. But it's really important to get that information for insur insurance purposes and, follow -up and following up. Um, once that report and that incident form is, is completed, make sure that the the lead person at that venue gets gets that and also reports that to their area director immediately um or if or if the person is the area director make sure that the uh, copy of that gets sent to the special Olympics maryland headquarters um, again it's for follow-up purposes etc um, the, the one note for this is this is not just injuries that happen to someone's person um, it can also be used for um, any damage that happens to the property at the at the facility um, or, uh, you know, your your property that you brought in, whether it's a computer or, you know, five chairs got broken or whatever. Um, it's just good to document that uh, for insurance purposes, et cetera. But again, uh, we'll show a copy of that incident report right here. And it's again for medical um, information as well as for, for damage or loss of property. So um, again, when you, when you look at this form, it's mostly set up for injuries, but when you say the description of the accident or property loss or dam property damage, um, that's where you just fill that in and uh, give some examples. If you, if you need to, you can use the back of the page to give uh, uh, more decisive information. But again, just want everyone to see uh, the basic uh, looks of the form. And again, those can be acquired either from the state office or from the county program office. So protests, um, it's, not a, it's not something that happens um, excessively, but it is an important component of the competition. 
Um, if there are protests, make sure that your, your person in charge of the actual competition components um, has copies of that. And you also let the head coaches know um, where they can pick one of those up uh, once they come in and check in as far as, hey, Anne Arundel County's here. Okay, hey, here's a little lay of the land, if you will. And if there's any issues come up, um, here's where you can find protests. But um, basically, the protests are for the head coaches to fill out um, in swimming. There are one or two other sports that athletes can fill those out. But for swimming, and most, I'd say 95% of the sports in Special Olympics, only the head coach can fill out the protest form. Um, they would hand it in um, to wherever you designate, you know, your sports check-in desk or whether it's combined with your competition staging or whatever. But um, the protest is really designated where there's an infraction of a, of a rule um, that the officials did not catch. It's not on an official's judgment. So for an example, in swimming, if an athlete gets DQ'd on the butterfly stroke because they did not touch um, with both hands and they did not also have a specialized note with a physical challenge, that that's not protestable. Um, it's, you know, it's other things that are, are not judgments uh, that are made by an official. <clears throat> Um, so again, just designate where you turn that in and report the protest to, uh, your, your committee that you've designated, which is the sports rules committee. Um, typically that's, you know, three to five individuals. Um, it can be your, uh, your head official. Um, if, if you can ahead of time, get a coach from one of the participating co uh, county programs. Um, it can be an athlete, um, from one of the participating programs as well. Um, it can be your games director, but, um, you know, you have to have a sports rules committee in place uh, so that if a protest is filed, that you can quickly grab those individuals on that committee, make a decision and report that back to the coach. Um, so, you know, again, have those forms, have your committee in place, let people know where they are. And, you know, if there is a judgment call that's that's uh, protested, uh, it's a quick decision denied, not not a rule violation. It's a judgment call. And we're not we're not addressing it any further. And again, uh, follow up with the coach that filed that protest to let them know the decision. So here's a basic uh, outline of that form and a copy of the form. So you have the date, the sport, the age group, the division, uh, the reason for the protest. Um, in most cases, it's if it's not turned in within 30 minutes of the event, um, it's denied. Um, so again, make sure that people know that um, ahead of time if someone comes and asks for the protest. So just just to make sure, you know, you've got to get this in 30 minutes after the completion of that event. Um, but again, it gives you the information that you need in order to bring some of those individuals in and talk about it. The one thing I will say is. Um, when you look at a, a coach to be on that committee, also get an alternate coach, because if it's the head coach from Anne Arundel protesting the situation and they're the one that you selected for your sport committee, obviously there's a conflict of interest there. So you always want to have an alternate situation if you have an athlete or coach on that committee. So Zach, I'll turn that back over to you at this point, I believe. Yeah, just any anybody with any questions on the the day of event management stuff, um, any of the stuff that we talked to, through, um, anything that popped up in your mind during that. Again, we'll we'll do we'll open it up for overall questions at the end. Uh, but I just wanted to check before we proceeded on here. I'm not seeing anything, Steve. So we will we will keep rolling here. All right. So. Uh, Post-competition assessment and follow-ups, um, Steve and I will kind of to double-team this a little bit to, to get us through the last handful of slides here. The most important thing is congrats, you've done it. So what's the next steps? You know, having the event's the most important thing. It's what you've worked towards. What comes after the event, though? Um, of course, venue breakdown, the venue's cleaned up, the area's cleaned up, equipment, trash, chairs, so on and so forth, like Steve said. Do that, that last sweep, make sure everything is good, check in with housekeeping, check in with your facility manager, 
uh, make sure everything's good to go uh, as at least as well as it was as when you came in, um, if not better, like Steve mentioned. Um, paperwork is organized, ready to take home. Who is the keeper of the paperwork and results? Who is taking that home to put in that, that information if it wasn't put in at the event? Um, volunteers, um, thank them uh, and dismiss them after cleanup. Again, you should probably also be thanking your volunteers throughout the duration of the event. Um, you know, when you get the chance and you see somebody or you see a group together, you know, take the chance to thank them. Um, you know, obviously you guys know as volunteers yourself, being thanked for things goes a really long way. Um, uh, after all the areas are broken down, again, meet with your team members, do a breakdown, thank them for all the work that they put in, remind them of all the good things that happened that day and all the efforts that they put in to make that happen. Um, again, without them, the event doesn't happen. You rely on them to, to make it all happen. Um, you can't do it yourself. Um, again, do a final walkthrough uh, as everybody leaves just to check areas, make sure you've picked everything up, make sure you have all equipment. Um, and then again, last thing we typically do is, is check in with the facility manager, uh, make sure everything's good on their end, everything's okay, they don't need anything done on, from your end, um, and thank them. Again, continue to build that relationship with that facility manager. Yeah, and as you're as you're doing your cleanup and and packing up the equipment at the end of the day, one of the things I would also stress is it 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 really pays off if you take a little bit of time at the end of the day and pack things up appropriately and not just throw them in a, a trailer or throw them in the back of the car. Do it do it uh, systematically. It saves you a lot of time when you get back and maybe it's all the stuff that you brought and now you get home and you look in the back of your truck or car and you're like oh my gosh, it's going to take me another hour to get all this organized. So use your team and your, use your volunteers um, at the end of the day to make sure everything's um, in good condition. It also um, helps to prevent any, any lost items or broken items that weren't packed properly and transporting them back to the original um, place of storage or uh, wherever you borrowed those from. Good, good tip, Steve. Again, work smarter, not harder. Make things easier for yourself. Um, you've had a long day at that point. You don't want to do quadruple the work when you unpack at home as well. Um, some follow-up stuff to, to be completed. Uh, make sure if results didn't get in during the competition, get them into GMS, Excel, uh, whatever your, your preferred format is from your paper files um, so that they have a centralized location. Um, once you have the results put together, programs really appreciate, I know you guys appreciate um, when we can get out results to you guys in a timely manner. So if you can send that out to anybody else that attended your event, they'll really appreciate that as well. Um, if you if you had a qualifier or competition that is um, qualifying and for a state level games like summer games or something for swimming, pass those results along to the sports director. So pass it along to myself. Um, one, again, it, it lets us know that you obviously have the competition if we weren't there ourselves. And two, it also gives us something that as we're divisioning and looking at stuff for, for summer games, you know, if, if there's a, a question about something, again, if somebody enters in a time and it looks funky, um, it gives us something to reference and look back at and, and definitely helps for sure. Um, again, email or phone thank yous to your management team, facility personnel, officials, and other uh, people that contribute to the day. Um, again, it's it's, you can never thank your volunteers enough. Um, they, they do everything to make the event happen and get you to that point. Um, again, they're part of your team. They're part of everybody that makes that day possible for our athletes. So thanking them as much as possible is great. Um, one thing that we like to do after events um, is debrief with the management team and the facility uh, personnel, have that planned and ready to go. Um, if you don't plan that ahead of time, before the competition, it tends to slip away that opportunity. Um, so if you have a chance during one of your last management team meetings, I would recommend planning a debrief call or meeting or whatever it may be um, for uh, a week or two after your, your event. So you can say, hey, this went well, this didn't go well, we want to tweak this, um, and potentially here's goals for next year. Um, and then again, if, if there's any way that after you finish that competition, you can set up your date for next year, Hop right on that. Again, I know that that depends on other people's timelines a lot, um, so that can be difficult at times, but if you can get on it, it's super beneficial for you guys to have it in as early as possible. Um, quickly, Steve, do you want to talk about the value of having a debrief since you've done quite a few of them? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Zach. 
Um, so the debrief, again, that's when you bring in your management team and any other key, key volunteers that you found throughout the day that you wanted to bring onto your team moving forward. Um, so one of the things we always like to do is, um, as you heard Zach saying that Neil does at summer games, is he walks around with a pad of paper and makes all the notes. Um, if you don't have that, a lot of things will hit you and your management teams throughout the day that, oh, I'll remember, we need to correct this for next year. But I can tell you, you won't remember everything unless your event's perfect. And if you told me you had a perfect event, you're a liar. Um, I've never seen a perfect event. But again, um, have everyone do little notes throughout the day. Then you gather those notes, you meet as a team, um, you discuss them. You make those uh, as goals to fix for next year. And again, you're just addressing things to continue to improve your event for future years. Um, and again, the little notes that someone may, may have made, there may be reasons that it, it, whatever happened, happened. So you can at least address why those situations occurred and what you can do to prevent those next year. And it may also trigger a thought that someone else had that they forgot to write down or whatever. Um, it also allows everyone on your team uh, to, uh, to, again, feel valued that it's not just, hey, we'll see you next year. Hey, let's as a team get together. Let's everyone have a voice. Um, even if there's nothing you want to contribute, at least you're part of the team. You're hearing all the discussions, and you may have some opinions or suggestions on how we can uh, do things better. So, um, and again, it sets the stage for the next year, and it keeps everything fresh. What I'll say is when you have your debrief, don't wait two or three months later and say, hey, thanks again. We'll meet in three months to talk about next year and we'll go over our notes. Do it uh, as soon as you can after the event, um, depending on people's schedules and whatever's going on. But the quicker you have it after event, the more fresh it is in everyone's mind uh, to give that, that feedback. So um, what we also do, and we've started doing over the last uh, year, year or two at the state level, is not just talk amongst your team, but also um, ask for feedback from um, all, all uh, attendees, whether it's the athletes, partners, coaches, families, volunteers. You guys may not have all of that information as far as contacting them, but what you do have is the coaches, the head coaches information. You have the volunteers information who pre-registered to help you. Um, you can send it out to those individuals and with the coaches say, hey, please share this with your athletes and partners. We're looking at how we can do better. As a group, we have Special Olympics Maryland, not just the state office, but you guys are part of Special Olympics Maryland as well. We're all working together for the same goal, and that's to provide the best competition experience for the athletes and partners that we possibly can. So the more feedback you get, the better. What I also always suggest is for individuals, you typically hear people who are, are griping about a certain situation. Always stress that we want to know what you liked and what you think we can improve upon. Um, if you only hear people griping about, you have three people griping about something, you change it, and next year people say, why the heck did you change it? That was awesome. You say, well, no one told us it was awesome. We only heard three people saying this was terrible and you need to fix this. So always ask for the pros and the cons of the event. <clears throat> So with that, again, any, any questions on the, on the breakdown um, uh, with the event, uh, with the follow-up, with the debriefs, anything like that? One of the things on the debriefs, you can always, again, you set your goals for next year, but you can also revisit the goals you had for that event. Did we accomplish those? If not, um, why not? And can we, can we look to do that next year? So we're just looking for any questions here. Um, with hands raised or typed in. I'm not seeing any, Steve, but I will progress us along here um, because the next one is just, this is, this is the opportunity to ask any questions for anything uh, tonight, any questions about hosting an event, ideas that you have that have come up from your event that you want to potentially get feedback on. Um, raise your hand. I know, I know it is late. Um, and I know it did go um the the three hours that we were looking um i know people probably want to get off and get to bed um but if, if you do have a question please raise your hand um, i don't want any questions to go unanswered because it is a little late um but with that said if it is late and we don't have any questions tonight you can always feel free to email us uh follow up in any way possible 
Um, we do have the, the registration for everybody in the group here. Um, so we can um, pass along that information if we need to. So I'm going to do... Yeah, the other thing well, I'll say is, is uh, as we're looking for any, any uh, questions at this time, um, again, we, we definitely appreciate your guys' um, time and, and sticking with us tonight. Uh, we hope it was helpful. We hope it provided you a stage um, to, to start looking at hosting some competitions and or if you have been hosting them, we hope it brought some, some new information to, uh, to help you um, develop uh, your competitions moving forward. Um, speaking of the feedback, um, you all should have Zach's email information. Um, this is kind of one of the first ones we've done in a while in this forum as far as talking about hosting competitions as a training session. So we'd like to get your feedback as we're looking to host uh, more of these for other sports. Um, so again, looking to always improve. Uh, tell us, uh, you can share with Zach anything you liked, anything you didn't like, or again, how we can improve. So um, with that, Zach, I'll turn it back over to you to see if there's any, any questions. Yeah, I, I don't see any questions right now. And to piggyback off of what you're saying, um, again, um, I'm trying to incorporate more diverse uh, coaches training experiences for, for our sports um, to get some new unique training opportunities on there. Uh, this was one of the thoughts that came up based on people having questions about competitions, especially relating to swimming. Um, so if you guys think of any other unique training opportunities that might be interesting or things that you have questions on that could lead to unique training opportunities, please feel free to reach out, let me know. Um, again, there's no bad ideas. We can potentially formulate something for next year. Uh, but other than that, if there are no questions, we will close it up for the night. Um, and like Steve said, I, we're super appreciative of you guys hanging in there, um, coming into this training, uh, getting this, this information, hopefully taking it back with you um, to start thinking about how you may upgrade your events, um, things that you may incorporate to your events, or if you haven't held an event before, maybe this will spur some ideas how to do it. Um, additionally, if you have any additional questions or are looking for insight uh, beyond this, um, I have had conversations with uh, Neil and Rob Dabry as well. They're always open to, to having uh, conversations uh, and, and meetings like this um, to take questions and stuff like that if they're available. Um, and they have said in the past that um, if you're looking to host a competition and are starting up and need a jump start and do need a, a management team uh, to potentially come in and, and run your first one and start training your future GMT members to do the things that they do, Neil has said that we can mobilize the Summer Games Games Management Team. So there are options on the table for jump-starting competitions as well. So with that said, again, thank you guys so much for being on tonight. We hope this was informative and uh, a good experience for you. And other than that, we appreciate everything you guys are doing, everything you guys are going to do, and that'll be it for the night. Have a great night, everybody.